Hello! How are we all doing? I hope you're doing better than I am. It's all crashed, didn't it, Mike? Mm. And burnt. I think it's back, but your guess is as good as mine. So when you can finally hear me, do let me know. You're live. Oh, I could be talking to myself. It, it, well, it was a good job you didn't hear what I had to say, I can assure you. Uh, it was Camtasia. Which is not good news, because if I can't get one version of Camtasia working to record things, uh, I was intending to demo that later. Mm, I'd be running two versions at the same time, but never mind. So, hello. Who was first? Who was first? Debbie was first. Hello, Debbie. I'm going to need to, to get that a little bit bigger, aren't I? Uh, and Pandemonium and Carol. Hello, Carol. We meet again. And Peter, Kim. Who else have we got? Gert. Uh, Paul, oh, isn't it silly o'clock, Paul? Really silly o'clock, I mean. Bad news. Well, so we got we've got Richard and Jonathan is in the house, as well as Frankie. Hello, Frankie. Graham is in. And who else do we have? If I've missed anybody, shout at me. I don't think shout you have. at me. I don't think I have. But the devs are in. There's there's the quiet majority isn't there? So hello, if you are one of the quiet majority, do feel free to say hello, but don't feel any pressure. Right. OK. Um, hopefully, you know, when, when rehearsals go really well mm. and you get cocky. Yeah. No, everything, everything crashed and burned. So uh, anything's going to be better than nothing. I've just noticed as well. Do you know um, we're only 10 shows off 200? I did. Yeah. I yes. did that, isn't it? Mm. Just yes, because I can count. Ooh. And if and if I can't, Excel can for me. Yes, Excel can do it for you. And if that fails, there's always chat GPT. <laughs> uh, Paul says, 6am. Good for an early rise. Oh, 6am. I'm still awake at 6am, but that's because I'm on my way to bed. Deb says hello from the quiet majority. <laughs> hello, Deb. Right, we've got an action-packed show, um, if, if, if I do say so myself. So let's make sure that you can see that before we go any further, because if you can't, it won't be any good. That's, that's fine. You can see what I can see. Excellent. Mouse is acting up, but never mind. So there's lots to see and do. In fact, why is the mouse there when it shouldn't be? So we have got, um, oh, I've put freebies and I've left the date. Do you know why? That, that's because where I've, I copied it from. It's all right. Ignore it. Right. We have the week at Mapbytes headquarters. been been busy and exciting. All change at Pixelmator. A pixel mate is really popular on my channel. And I must admit, I don't even do that many videos. In fact, it's a week of change because uh, we've got Cloud App playing with my mind. Uh, then Dropbox Capture, YouTube Shorts. There are two up there now. Let me know in the chat if you've seen them. Uh, and then we have Toblerone Thomas making a, 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 a special guest again. A special guest. Yes. With, with, with Tobe, Toblerone. Um, we've got the freebies. Jammy's not here. Jammy's not here yet. He's at the gym. Yeah. It, 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 why go to the gym and then turn up with a load of treats? Why not just don't eat the treats and don't bother with the gym? It's a lot cheaper. Uh, yes, he's doing the sequence function. But uh, then on to the freebies, which I, I, I've clearly not told you what it is. But there's a surprise coming then, isn't there? Uh, two things in Obsidian. Working the outline um, with a community plugin. Uh, and then, why have I got icon devices? Oh, I told you everything crashed and burnt, didn't I? Mm. I have to fix that. Make a note for me to fix it. Multiple devices. Icons have got nothing to do with it. I've no idea why that word's there. Let's move swiftly along. <laughs> when it starts bad, it's usually a good show, <clears throat> she said. So we're broadcasting in 1080p. Make sure you're watching in 1080p. Don't think YouTube did anything silly this week. Although I was watching a video and it was... Um, was it 10? Yes, it was 1080p. And it was fuzzy as heck. So I don't know what they were playing at. While you are down there, because there is a cog in the lower right hand side to ensure that you are watching in the highest quality possible, there is a like button. We love the like button. YouTube love the like button. So if you enjoy it, give us a like. Makes a difference. So, winding back to last Saturday. Oh, it was. It was an important day last Saturday. It was the first day of shipping in the April 2023 cohort. I think I've over challenged myself this time. <laughs> I had a plan. Uh, once I tried my plan, yes, that was going to prove a bit difficult, but I did manage. Um, I haven't run out of things to write about, so that essay was quite right. But I did come up with a cunning plan, which I revealed on day two, which was Sunday. So uh, it, let me know in the chat if you're following along. 
Uh, Mike, meanwhile, was glued to the football. I can't believe it's only a week ago that they beat Everton. Which it is, isn't it? It is. Yes, yes. They actually won. Did they play well? I can't remember. As I heard it, they didn't, but there you go. Uh, then we were waiting for Asda. Now, the thing with Asda is, obviously, Mike has sacked off Tesco. So we're waiting for Asda. But Asda can come at any point, can't they? Mm. They kind of say to Mike, um, here's a text. It's five past three in the afternoon. We'll be with you shortly. But but the order's not until nine o'clock. But you get the text anyway. Anyway, uh, it was about half past eight, I think. They completely surpassed themselves. Yes, I was amazed as well. Not only did they deliver what we'd ordered, ballpark, they brought us some flowers because it was Easter. Was that not a bit embarrassing? You and the other guy stood at the door with the other guy giving you a bunch of flowers. Not at all. (laughs) He said, we've sent you some flowers because it's Easter. Well, let's just say they get the business this week, don't they? Mm. So it was a shrewd investment on their part, those Easter flowers that they gave us. You wouldn't get that from Tesco. You don't even get what you've ordered from Tesco. (laughs) Right. uh, So Sunday, I revealed all what my cunning plan was for Ship 30. Um, This happened because I've been studiously for six cohorts writing. And then I thought, you know what? Writing, not my superpower. I can do it and I've certainly improved. But I'm a video girl. So uh, I'm breaking all the rules. Uh, I am writing about a topic and then there's a short on the topic on YouTube. Yeah, that was when I thought it's, it's, it's a short. It's a minute. How difficult can it be? Don't ask. Just don't ask. You've tried it since, haven't you? I have. It's not as easy as you'd think, is it? No. No, you see, you see shorts from people and you think, well, you just sit in front of your camera and talk. No, 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 no. Not when you're doing a software demonstration. No, it looks like that. You cannot have a second of of dead movement. It don't stop or people will click away. So um, I'll be sharing more on that later. Mm. Now, this being Sunday, surely United weren't playing again. No, no, they weren't. Mike was busy being unfaithful to his beloved United, watching, wait for it, the Liverpool Arsenal game. He couldn't make his mind up who he wanted to win. So they they played out a draw for him. You weren't too upset, were you? Because if you are unaware, in this country, in the Premier League, if you win, you get three points. If you draw, you get one point. So rather than one team making off with three points, they've only got one point each, which is actually a loss of two points, if you think about it. Mm. Yeah. So didn't end badly for Mike. Although there were some hairy, scary moments, wasn't there? Oh, and there was, there was a, a calamity, wasn't there, with the ref? Wasn't that the match with with the linesman? Oh, they the don't call them that now. Yeah. Assistant referee. Yeah. Yes. If, you, if you've seen the match, you'll know exactly what we mean. Uh, he all but decked a player. Yeah, it's all right. He got away with it. So that took me on to Monday. We, we met up on Monday, if you remember. It was Designer Church Newsletter in Affinity Publisher which is available on demand now. Uh, Whether it's a church newsletter or any other kind of newsletter, there is stuff in there that is copiously relevant to you. You may also remember, I think it was last Friday, because at this stage it's now Tuesday, but uh, I I think it was Friday and we said we were starting the push to 26,000. Yeah, I was amazed as well. What's happening? I'm I'm sure I'm going to wake up and YouTube will have come to their senses and 5,000 people will vanish. But fingers crossed they don't. So, so we're at 26. So I did say we needed to come up with an idea for 30,000, like a party or something. Special live stream. Let me know what you think. Wednesday, very important. Very, very important day for Mike and I. Not that anybody else ever remembers, but never mind. Uh, it was our anniversary. Yeah, 31 years together. Mm, mm. I don't want you doing any maths at this point. Forget forget the maths, forget the 31. And yes, that was the card that I got, Mike. Here we are on my 25th birthday. Look at that. We'd been going out mm, six weeks, yeah. five, six weeks at that stage. Look at us, young love. Um, and just proving that love endures. Mm. Mike bought me a present. 
which was very good of him. He got the present okay. That wasn't a problem. Couldn't find any sellotape, so used uh, duct tape. Didn't you? Mm. This duct tape's an arm and a leg. <laughs> it's special. It's special duct tape. Um, not duct tape. What do you call it? Masking tape. Um, that when you peel it off, it doesn't peel the paint off. Well, obviously, you know, he used it to wrap my gifts. <laughs> Couldn't make it up. Could not make it up. Um, Thanks and, for the anniversary wishes in the chat, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, when at once I'd opened said gifts, um, look at that. Mike knew that I'd got, if you remember, that the longest delivery in living memory uh, was was a dead tree book. He bought me some bookmarks for my dead tree book. They're, they're proper wood and they've, they're adorned with pandas. So I, I'm very, very happy with them. <laughs> Uh, Thursday, so you remember what happened on Tuesday. Yeah, Thursday, I was amazed as well. Gets out of bed and told it's 27,000. Where are these people coming from? Welcome aboard if you are with us. You know, Let me know how you found us. Um, and Mike checked just before we started, didn't, didn't you? Mm. And we're now at 27.7. <coughs> so the, another 700 since yesterday. So hello to each and every one of you. Right. Uh, oh, also today. Yes, because uh, no, no, this was yesterday. This was a, a coaching call yesterday, um, which was enjoyable. Then I put up another short. So it was my second short. I've not said I'll do a short every day for 30 days. I might do it for 30 days, but they won't be consecutive because it takes that long. Trust me. Um, but there was a second one yesterday. Uh, was was the edit any more, e more easy to do? No, no, it wasn't. Look at that. No, it wasn't. Um, but... Oh, last night. Big game. Big game. Uh, and you had it on BT Sport, didn't you? Which meant we could both watch it. Mm. We could have it on two iPads. Um, so we did. And it was all going incredibly well, wasn't it? Until the last six minutes. We were coasting at 2-0. Now, this is the problem. They go 2-0 up within 21 minutes and that's it. They shut up shop. I said we should have stuffed them about 6-0. But we threw it away in injury time. They were having trouble scoring as well. So our club captain put one in for them. Bad words were said, weren't they, Mike? They were. <laughs> and it's only the first leg of a two-leg quarterfinal. So we've got to do it all again next week. Uh, the difference is in Seville. I've, I've got a, a sneaking suspicion they'll give us a very, very warm welcome. We've got players now injured who've fallen over themselves and all kinds of stuff. So it's not looking well anymore. Luckily, it's only the tin pot, isn't it? But we were after the tin pot, weren't we? Hmm. What are you giggling at? Slabhead. <laughs> Peter's called him in the chat. Mm, mm. So that brought us on to today. Um, I wasn't actually expecting that much today, but <laughs> Captain's Table Mastermind was on. And as Carol will confirm, minds were blown absolutely minds were blown the number of ideas and carol was the star of the show so <laughs> congratulations carol just just watching what happened on the screen i hope i hope you were writing it all down uh, hopefully they'll put the recording out later that that is one i will be re-watching so let's get on with with what's been going on this week so it's all change at pixelmator uh, you may be aware that there's pixelmator classic there's Pixelmator Pro. There was Pixelmator Photo Photo on iOS. So it was all complicated. The Pixelmator Photo was something that I was I had quite high expectations for. It was released in April 2019. I did a live session on it. I think the link's there, Mike. But when I did the live session, I started off with this. Expectation management. Don't expect that much, basically. That it was an app that was going to be Marmite. You were either going to love it or you were going to loathe it because many people back then were expecting a fantastic version of Pixelmator on the iPad. No, it wasn't that. At the time, Pixelmator Pro had been out for a couple of years. So maybe this fantastic app was going to be Pixelmator Pro on the iPad. No, it wasn't that either. Um, is it in any way related to Photoshop, the things that Photoshop can do on an iPad? No, it wasn't. Uh, then there was Affinity Photo, fantastic on an iPad. No, it wasn't that either. So at this point, you're like, well, what on earth is it? It was much more akin to Snapseed or one of the other apps that started life on an iPad. 
and they called it Pixelmator Photo. It was iPad only and it was very machine learning oriented. So I guess you could do quite a lot with it, but not in the same way that you were used to with all of those other apps. So you either loved it or you loathed it. Uh, short version is it no longer exists. So Pixelmator Photo, Photo, R-I-P. It's now called Photomator. Now, I was interested. Mm, Pixelmator, Photomator, Vectormator. They've talked about Vectormator for a while, but no sign of it yet. So Pixelmator Photo is now Photomator and it's coming to Mac. So at the moment, they've opened beta applications. So if you want to try it on the Mac, get your application in to try it. I have already put my application in, not heard back yet. Going to be grumpy if I don't hear back. When I do hear back, I could demonstrate this on iPad. And when I hear back and get into the program, I should be able to demonstrate it on the Mac. Let me know in the chat. Do you want to see it on the iPad? Do you want to see it on the Mac or do you want to see it on both? Or neither. Do you not care? <laughs> I think when a new app comes out, we're all interested, aren't we? We are all interested. So the stuff that I did uh, before years ago now is probably relevant, but they've added to it. So happy to happy to do that. Let me know. Let me know. Right. Uh, so what next? Oh, the cloud app have been threatening to, to play with my mind. So cloud app is the app that I have demonstrated before and it is critical to me. Cloud app dies, I am in trouble. Um, it's very similar to Dropler if you use Dropler. Now, way back in the day, I got a lifetime deal on both of them. I think it was via AppSumo. So I'm not paying silly prices per month, but it is critical for what I do. What it does, it allows you to upload images to the cloud and as you do so, it automatically copies a link to your clipboard that you can then paste in your notes app. If you are clever with the link that you are given, you can not only paste the link in and then be able to click it to go and see the image, but you can actually pull the image through. So what have they done this week? Well, apparently, and this goes back at least five years, people have been complaining that the app is called Cloud App. And I'm like, why? It's just a name. It's like Nokia. They were a fish company. Now they make phones. So what? But people were assuming that it worked with iCloud. Now, in what way? I have no idea. An app called Cloud App, what do you expect it to do? But people were giving them a one star review saying it's not compatible with iCloud. Well, they never said they were. It's not that kind of app. Anyway, they must have had enough of this and decided to rebrand. So they've rebranded to Zeit. I'm not, I just don't think that's... Insight would be kind of cool, like Insight, but with a Z. But Zeit, wasn't there a magazine was thing called Zeit? It was a Zite? magazine app for many, many years ago. Yes, but it, it wasn't G-H-T. It was Z-I-T-E. But Simon it, didn't know that Nokia were a fish company. Nokia were a fish company in Norway. That was how they started. And they didn't change their name when they moved into mobile phones. So a lot of these company names, when you think back to them, they, they do have maybe some meaning. I mean, I don't, I don't know what Nokia is in Norwegian. Does it mean fish or something? <laughs> it would make sense if it did. <laughs> Um, but, you know, you can trace names back and they do have different meaning. Like when Apple changed from Apple computers to Apple mm. and Manchester United Football Club became Manchester United. Better for branding. It's always dangerous when they start changing stuff for branding. But that's what's happened. Now, in terms of functionality, no difference at all. So just as a reminder, I will show you how I use it. But up here, I've got it running. And it is in my... Come on, hidden items. Oh, we're in a mood, aren't we? It's here. So this is what it actually looks like if I click on it uh, and bring it up. So there's all the things that I've uploaded and I can capture stuff. I can record stuff. You'll notice in the top corner here, it says Zite. So literally that got updated about two hours ago. I did not need to do anything at all 
in terms of reconfiguring it or reconfiguring it to share. And that was really important to me. So I will show you how I use this. I'm just wondering where I put where I put things. Yes, I've got day seven somewhere. I slung that somewhere. Let's see if I can find day seven. Uh, no, that's day six. Oh, well, never mind. Let's go for day one and two. So what I'm doing is I'm putting some of these where we can get to them and showing you. So I've got some images, day one and day two, and these are my essays. So if I want to take those essays and put them inside Obsidian, for example, doesn't have to be Obsidian, but inside Obsidian, then if I drag and drop it into Obsidian, now I had to close Obsidian because everything got silly. So um, let, let's open Obsidian and hopefully it will open both vaults. I've got uh, this is uh, hopefully this is the demo vault. Are you the demo vault? You're thinking about it, aren't you? Where you go. Oh, there's been an update as well on top of everything else. This is my demo vault. Right. So they've made more updates and improvements, etc. But let's say I have a new page notes and I want to put in here the content of my essay. Um, let me get the content of my essay for a start. This is what I do in my proper vault. So is this I'm putting in day one. So I'm going to get day one. So what that looks like is I write it in here and that's what it looks like. But then, of course, I have the actual essay itself. And here's the problem. If I decide to put that in there, so I don't want to do that, do I want the finder, which is behind you. So I want to take this image and I want to put it in there. I'm going to take that off the screen and then drag and drop it in here. And it will do that. But notice what it's done. Put the image in and over here I have the JPEG in the root of the vault because I haven't told it to put it anywhere else. And whereas that vault was probably about 20, 30 K with what was in it, that image is another 230 K. So if you put images in your vault, it will grow in size exponentially. So I don't want that. Another problem that you've got is that's the reference that you've got to your vault, to, to the image in your vault. So I'm going to get rid of that and that takes it out of my note. So problem solved then, hey? Well, it would do with old style notes apps like Evernote. If something's there and you delete it, it's gone. But in here, it's not. It sits there, which means I can reference it again if I want. But how do I know which images I no longer want? Mm, that's why I never bring anything in there. So I'm actually going to delete that. What I do gives me exactly the same thing, but it does it without increasing the size of the vault. So that's why I use Zite. I'll, I'll, I'll be bound to say cloud up. Forgive me. So how I do that, I have my image here. Now, most people go up here and then they would click on there. And then they would say, go and get an image or they would drag and drop the image up to here. There is a much faster way. So if I right click, I have an option to share. And this is using the system share component. You can't get rid of messages and you can't get rid of airdrop. Trust me, if you could, I already would have done. But I have only added one more. So I have deliberately taken away things like day one and other kind of apps that I may want to take an image into because I use Zeit that much. I want to quickly just be able to get into there and get to the one I want. So the only one that I have enabled is Zeit, which means from anywhere in my OS, I can just click and that is being uploaded in the background. It has copied the remote URL to the clipboard. Which means in here I can do exactly what I'd done before. Only instead of dragging and dropping it in, I'm going to type MM for multi markdown URL. It will take what's on the clipboard and it will put that in there, pulling it in live. Yes, that does mean if you have no Internet, you are not going to see the image, but the image doesn't get deleted. It's just text based. 
It does not add anything to my vault. And yet there is my image. So all of the images that I put in here, let's put another one in, which is day two. Uh, that was the cunning plan, I think. Day two. Right. Cunning plan. And I have that in here with the other one. Don't disappear. Oh, dear. I've seen it moving in episodes. I let go of that about five minutes ago. There we go. Right. So all I need to do, click on it, right click on it, share, choose site. It will sort it out. Uploads it in the background, copies the link to the clipboard. All right. Let's get that out of the way. And go into here. I haven't got the text in here, but I'm about to put the image in. So the exclamation mark means pull it through. And then I put MMURL, that gets extended, put on there, and the image comes in underneath. So that's what I need Zite for. But if you were thinking that's fantastic, I want to do that, it's £10 a month, which is all its money, isn't it? There is a free version, but the free version limits you to 25 captures. It doesn't say per month or per week. So I'm presuming it's 25 rolling captures. Which is probably OK if what you're doing is putting this in. Um, maybe sharing it to Twitter, you know, a week from now, no one's going to be looking at that anyway. So it's just like a rolling 25. Um, but for what I want to do, these links need to stay there. They need to work. So if you don't want to do that, there is an alternative. So we'll get that out of the way. This is free. So Dropbox Capture works with a free Dropbox account. Obviously, you don't have the same amount of storage as you would with a paid for account. But there is good news. As you go through the process of setting up this app, the app is free and the Dropbox account is a free Dropbox account. Um, when you are setting it up, they will give you an incremental amount of extra space as you go through the process. So I think it's split into four. And I thought it was comical because I've got a pro account. So I've got three terabytes and it gave me a little message that said you've got 50 meg more. I thought, thank you. <laughs> so I think in total, you probably get 200 meg for setting this up. Right. It is a completely separate app from the Dropbox account. Obviously, to, for it to work, you need to have Dropbox set up on your machine. Um, it picks up what kind of machine you're on. So you can see there that the option is to download for Mac OS on Intel. But if you have silicon, then you can download the one below. I'm presuming they would flick over if you had a silicon Mac, which I don't. So let's go have a look at that and see how it can replace something like that. So up here, we actually have Dropbox Capture. You can see I've set up a little bit of it. And yes, it's 200 meg when you've finished. So what I've done is set up part of it. Um, I have set up the permissions required. So as soon as you try and use this, it will prompt you to set the permissions up. So obviously I needed to do that. And in so doing, I took my first capture, but I did not edit one. So what you have with this, the app runs from the menu bar here. I normally have this hidden, but I've got it there for demo purposes. And in your preferences in here, this account at the top is actually your Dropbox account. You can check for pref for updates. Looks like it's up to date, thankfully. And you can set up preferences. And in the preferences, you're setting up uh, cameras, microphones, the quality of the video, which can go up to 4K. Now, I, th I think that might be limited on a free account. So you might need to think about that. Um, what to do? when you take a screenshot. So in this case, you want to copy the link, which is exactly what Zite is doing. So in here, you can copy the link or you can copy the image. So if you prefer to paste into your notes app, you can do. Um, I obviously want the link. Now there is one huge caveat with this, which in terms of doing exactly what I do, um, it's not there yet. It can be, but there's a bit of a manual step. But copying the link is the start to it. And then you can determine whether you want to automatically save any standard OS 
screenshots that you take. So on the standard shortcuts, which is command shift and four and command shift and three and command shift and five, when you take a screenshot with that, do you automatically want Dropbox Capture to zoom in and take that capture and treat it as if it took it or not? Now I have that turned off. Or I think I do. Is that on or off? Yes, it's off that. That's not very clear, is it? Uh, no, 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 no. Go away. Go away. Oh, no. Oh, good grief. Now it's upset everything. <laughs> oh, let's have a look. Oh, now it's opening over here. That's cool, isn't it? Never mind. Can we move that? No, we can't. Right. So now we're now we're looking at it over here. Right. So back into the preferences. Uh, or are you not going to let me into the preferences? There we go. Right. And um, do you want to open the screenshot and mark it up afterwards or not? That depends how you intend to use this. If I was using this as a replacement for Zeit, then I wouldn't want it to open for markup because I very seldom mark up an image. However, if I was running this alongside Zeit, um, and I did want to mark up an image, then what I could do is I could take my standard short screenshots with Zeit and I could then use this one when I did want to mark it up. So that, that's one option. Then you've got your shortcut keys. So there are shortcut keys available for you to specify. I think they've not put any in by default um, because there are so many shortcuts that Apple have already taken. And you may want to remap them in some kind of way. Um, I think I've run out of shortcut options. I've got something on command shift and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven and eight. Don't know about nine or zero. So maybe I could try one of those. But you can put shortcuts in for the, for the things that you use frequently. And then you have the advanced options, which is do you want to launch it on startup? Do you want to show it in the dock? Now, the ones that are turned on are the generating closed captions, notified when somebody views and fade out the video markup. Right. Um, it's whether you want to mute the microphone for screen recording, which obviously seems a bit odd. And then you can specify themes. So there is an automatic theme applied uh, or you can have light or dark. And then you can have languages. Um, not too many to choose from. Well, Enough, I suppose. But if you happen to speak something else, it's very strange that they've got like Indonesian and Malaysian, but not some European languages like uh, Portuguese or something like that. Mm, strange. But there you go. So uh, I think I've had to set mine to United States, haven't I? Yes, there is no UK English. So those are the options that you actually have in there. Now, as I say, to do what I was doing, slightly difficult but now you can open this on the web and you have this capture folder as well so obviously opening it on the web is going to open it in Dropbox on the web and this capture folder is a local folder but it's a local folder inside Dropbox it automatically decided where to put that so if I hit the open and wait oh no hang on other screen there we go it's opened it. So you can see it's from my Dropbox folder and it's straight off the root of Dropbox locally. So when I take a screen capture, that's where it's going to go. But obviously it's going to be online as well in Dropbox in the cloud. So I will leave that on one side. And what should I take a screenshot of? Oh, we'll take a screenshot over here of this one. Right. So bring that on ready for a screenshot. Now, I haven't set up any shortcut keys, so I'm going to go to the top here for that. Do I need to finish this off? I don't think I do. So I've got three options here. Do I want to record the screen and use the camera? <laughs> no, never. Do I want to record the screen? That's a possible. Or do I want a screenshot? So if we assume that I want a screenshot, I don't need a shortcut key. I can do that. Now, what's happened is on all three monitors, I've got the same message, which is click or press enter for the entire screen. Now, pressing enter, I don't think would do me any good if I wanted one of the other screens unless I move to it. No, it doesn't make it active. So I think clicking is probably the best bet here. If you only want part of the screen, then you can drag out over it. So if I wanted that bit, I could drag out over it. Not that I'm getting the whole thing. 
but it has taken the screenshot and it's telling me at the bottom it's taken the screenshot and I can paste it in or I can mark it up. I can make a copy or I can send it to the bin. So I'm going to send that one to the bin. That one needs to be wider for that and definitely needs to be wider. That's better. So and we will do that again. So up there, down to screenshot. And the last one was to press space if you want a specific window. So uh, the space shortcut is a standard shortcut, but I am going to draw around that. Right. So if I wanted it, as we say, I can paste it in, but I can also mark it up. If I open that up, it looks like poor man's version of sketch. So you can choose what you want. And so you've got text that you can put on there. You can draw squiggly lines. You can highlight stuff. So if I go in on the highlighter, do I actually have to choose orange in here or is it just going to be? No, it's going to be a yellow anyway. There we go. Well, actually, it might be. Let's have a look. Would it be purple? Oh, dear. Yes, but it's a highlighter. So you are getting um, that you can see through it if you're with me. Luckily, you can also undo that. <laughs> Let's undo that one. That's not good. Right. You've then got lines that you can draw. Uh, you can hold the shift key down. So if you don't hold the shift key down, might not be straight. Hold the shift key and it's straight. You've got arrows. So let's change this to a bright red for the arrow and draw the arrow in. Not quite as sketch like as I'd like, to be honest. Sketch was nice with mock ups. Then you can draw circles on it. So all the standard stuff that you would actually be expected to, to be able to do. But you also have here, which is you can blur things if you want. So if we go over the top of that, that's that's well blurred, isn't it? <laughs> you definitely can't read that. You can crop the image. So if you wanted to crop it slightly and bring it in, we could probably crop that a bit, couldn't we? And OK there. And then we've got this one, which is bring the emojis on. So, yes, it's on fire. Uh, these can be moved around and they can be scaled. Now, you can do this kind of stuff with Zite. I wouldn't say it's as easy as this, but I never want to do this when I'm saving an image. That's why I would have more than one app for doing it. You know, if I want to do this kind of stuff, I would either use this Dropbox Capture or I would use Snagit, which can do this kind of stuff. Right. At that point, you can save it, but you've also got a drop down as well. So save and copy the image itself. Or do you want to save and copy the image link? Now, obviously, the image link was what I actually wanted in Zite. So let's do the save and copy the link. And then that I can close down. Now, what does that link actually look like? So if I come down here and I paste that link in, that is the link of the image. So if I click it, I can go out and have a look at that. So go to the next line and click that. It has opened in my browser. I will bring it across so I can show it to you. And it's having a think about it. And that is what it looks like. Now, that is good and it is bad. It's good that you've got all of these options in here. You can choose who to share. Anybody with the link can view it. It will show you how many people have viewed it. You can attach stuff. You can add this to a collection. It's amazing. But the one thing it won't do is the link here that it's gone to is a link that is a page. My other links were not pages. They were links directly to the image. Why that's important is it means that in here, Whereas for this image above, let's go and look at the text of that. There is an exclamation mark. There is an opening square bracket, a closing square bracket and an opening round bracket. At the end, there is a closing round bracket. And what was copied to my clipboard was this. I know it's absolutely hideous. It's a hideous URL, but I don't care because I never see it. If we were to do exactly the same, we wouldn't get the same result. So moving down to the bottom, exclamation mark, and then put MMURL. It looks like we get exactly the same, but you can see it's broken. And it's broken because that link is not an image. It's a page. Now from in here, I think I did do this once. I was testing it out. 
Right, there is a link here that you can copy the link. Oh, don't start jumping all over. Where have you gone now? Crying out loud, it's put it on the other monitor. Right, let's go in there and copy the link. That link is this link here, so that won't do either. Uh, can I here? No, I don't think you can anymore. Hmm. Not from in there. Doesn't look like you can actually copy a link to the image itself. Not even in there, can we? I'm sure you used to be able to. There is another way of doing it. It's just annoying. Right, so up here, we had the ability to open the capture folder, which was local. But we also had this to open it on the web. So we could click that and it will go to capture.dropbox.com. There is my image. So I'm wondering if in here I can copy that. What would we get for that? Uh, let me go and get Obsidian and see what we get for that. I definitely did this. I managed to persuade it in the end to give me the link that I was looking for. So let's go in there. Nope, it's the same one, which is a page, which is not what we're looking for. But what I guess we could do, if we can't do it from in there, doesn't look like we can, doesn't seem to want to. What we can do is go to Dropbox. And because it is just an image in a folder, so this is the root of my Dropbox when it finally loads. There we go. There is the capture folder. I can open that up and there is that. And you can copy the link. I wonder what link we'll get this time. That one looks like a link to the file. So if I take that and I go to Obsidian, we might have more luck. So let's put that in, exclamation mark, MMURL. If you're wondering where the MMURL is coming from, it's not liking that either, is it? No. Oh, dear. You you should be able to do this. You definitely should be able to do this. Um, what are you doing here? Mm -hmm. Do I actually have to, to share you properly? Share with Dropbox. Should we do that one and get a proper link? Copy the link to that. Anyone with the link can view. Right, but can you do it from Obsidian? Uh, let's try again. Didn't like that one. No, we didn't like that one either. Right, if you're wondering about the MMURL, that is me using Typinator. You can use any text expansion. And all it's actually doing is putting in the two square brackets, the round bracket, taking what's on the clipboard and pasting that in and putting a closing bracket at the end of it. But you can see the problems that I'm having with this. And this is why I use CloudApp. But if you want to mark it up, this is a good way to work. I'm wondering if I can get a link for that. Uh, you used to be able to. Looks like you can't anymore or it's going to be a nightmare to try and do it. But if what you want to do is to share that link with other people, then what they would actually see is this. You can give them permission to um, put comments on it and stuff like that. So to me, they're two different apps. But if you didn't want to pay for Zite, then this is one way around it. What you'd have to do in your notes app, unfortunately, is put it in here just as that link. So none of this stuff down here, you just have to put it in as that link. And then when you want to see what the image is, actually click it and then it will take you out and show you the link. Uh, are there any other ways to do what I do? Well, there's Dropler, but again, that's expensive as well. But all you actually need is any link where you only see the image. So shall we try something different? Let's try drive.google.com. I think this has just had a facelift, hasn't it? Have I got the facelift yet? Not sure. Right. So in here, I have a folder called public. So uh, we've retired the black hole. Kim will be pleased to know. We've retired the one on Google Drive and we've moved it to Dropbox. We had it on Google Drive, then we moved it to Dropbox and then we had problems. Then we moved it back to Google Drive. Now we've gone back to Dropbox. Um, I haven't bothered moving anything. It just stays there. But these two folders are shared. This black hole is shared with Mike and the public one is shared wherever. So anything that's in here 
uh, should should be shareable. So you can see this is stuff that I've shared about uh, all kinds of stuff in here, lighting rigs and stuff of mine. And I always put a date so so I know which is which. Oh, look, there's you at Nero, Mike. Yeah, I mean, who who doesn't need to see Mike at Nero? Um, Do so I need to see me in here? You need, you need to see you in Nero. There okay. you go. Look at that face. That's the Trafford Centre, so it looks like we'd spent money at Apple. We could usually go into Nero to recover. Why have I put two R's in Nero? Can't spell either. But this link that you've got up there, because it's public, you should be able to use that. So let's see if that works. It's going to be a terrible demo if it doesn't, isn't it? But, you know, bear with me. It's been a bit of a week. Right, let's see if that works. No, we don't like that either. Crying out loud. There is a link that will work. I have no idea where to get it from. This is why I use Zite. Can you see why Zite's actually worth it? But, you know, at least you've you've had the pleasure of seeing Mike. <laughs> Where's my drink? Oh, there's mine. Glass of water. There you go. Uh, what else have we got in here that's worth looking at? Mm, I don't think there's anything going to be as good as a picture of Mike at Nero, is there? I think the flapjack had been eaten by that point. Oh, do you think there was flapjack as well? Oh, there's usually a flapjack with hot oh. chocolate. Oh, cool. Oh, there's a Samoid there. Is that, is that our it is a It is a hot chocolate, um, Simon, yes. Oh, yes, that was that picture that kicked it off on Twitter. People said she's washed its face. No, that's what Sammys look like when they get filthy. The faces stay white. No kidding, it's different fur. That's a genuine picture, I swear. I'm sure we got some in here of Lola as well. I know I've got some of lettuce, but I don't touch that. No idea what that's about. Oh, surely there's one of Lola somewhere. There must be. Drafts Pro and apps and Christmas stuff. Ladies night. Oh, Ollie, there's a picture. That, that's the dog we used to look after. Look at that face. That was pre-Lola. But they did have a crossover week, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Lee yeah, said about that. Yes, Lee said about that. Um, he ha he didn't have his batteries. She did have her batteries. He had no idea what to do, did he? <laughs> but he gave it a good old go. Yes, we were, Lee said about that, the better, I swear. Right. OK. Um, so you see why I use Zite, because it's very difficult to get the right link that you can share with. You can do it. It can be done. So let's see if I can prove a way that it can be done. So let's take that over there and open up Snagit. Uh, did you have all the little marshmallows, Mike? Yes. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? <laughs> Right, so that's Snagit. So Snagit enables me, because we have the share link option in the top corner, uh, you can share to your Mac share locations, which includes Zite. So I could just click that and it would upload to Zite from here. This is why this is so good as far as I'm concerned. If I'm in Eagle, I can send something from Eagle. It doesn't matter what app I'm in because it's system wide. That share thing is brilliant. But you do have other options in here. So if we go back in there, you do have to Dropbox. You do have to save as a file and you do have to Google Drive. So if I choose to send that to Google Drive, oh, what on earth is this going on about? I've no idea what password that wants now. Um, let's try that one and see if it works. Oh, you you want me to do it 15 times, do you? Right, come on. Let's, let's, let's do, do this and say always. Invalid, doesn't like it. OK, for crying out loud. It's because I send it up to them. Let, let, let's see if I can get another one. Crying out loud. You're going to send it to Dropbox and just do it, are you? How about that? It's really trying. Fingers crossed. Oh, oh, looks like we're getting somewhere. Right. So this is what I used to see, which is I've asked it to stop so I can type in a file name. So I always start with the date. And then because this one is a demo, I would put demo and it's Dropbox Capture, which is what I'm uploading. So that's what this tick in this box does here. Now, its destination folder is public, but you can change that with the browse button. But this is bypassing the capture process, the Dropbox capture process. So technically speaking, I should be able to upload that and it should actually work. Up here, it's saying link copied. 
So it's using an entirely different mechanism than Dropbox Capture, but it's using my space on Dropbox. And it's put a link in. Let's have a look where that link is going. Uh, pretty similar, I would say. Uh, so I'm pulling out the page so I can share it with you. Right, so it's showing you the capture. Uh, it's got some information underneath it, but it still isn't that direct link that we need, unfortunately, which it used to be. They're getting far too clever for their own boots, aren't they, Mike? Mm. Why can't they just do things simply? But this is why site is worth it. The problem is the price of it. If that comes on offer, which sometimes it does with Stack Social, I would say dive in and get it. If it's a lifetime deal, just, just throw money at them because you don't have any of these problems. You know, I had this working and now this doesn't work because Dropbox have changed how they work. Uh, maybe um, Google Drive won't, but it, it's a moot point, really, whether it will or not, isn't it? it you don't know whether it will work or not. But it is a great option if you want to mark something up before you share it or you're looking for comments because you can see you get the comments down here. And Mike and I do actually use this for real, don't we? We do. But not for images. When we have um, audio to be checked or a video to be checked, we can upload it. It looks exactly like that, but it's audio or, or a video. And then one or other of us, the one who's listening, will listen or watch and then put comments in down here. The beauty of that with audio and video in Dropbox is the comments are time stamped. When you click on the comment, it takes you to that place in the audio or video, which is the sole reason we pay for Dropbox, don't we? Mm. And seeing as though that costs us £400 a year. <laughs> We better use it a lot. But for shared stuff like this, for commenting on, for annotations, this is probably the best bet. But Zite works brilliantly for everything else, as does Dropler. So do we have any questions on that? We have one from Patience, uh, just for some clarif clarification. So they have set it up like the free P Cloud, where you can earn so much free space by doing different things. Yes, that's exactly what they've done with it. So if you have a free account, 200 meg might be quite a lot for you. So if I go back to where we were, which was, oh, it was in here, wasn't it? Let's get that out of the way. What hadn't I done in here? Um, oh, it looks like, oh, here's my, my quick start at the bottom. So I need to bring that up. And now I've edited a screenshot. So you saw me edit it and crop it and stuff like that. So I'm going to confirm that I've done that. Or is it not going to let me do that? Does it have to recognise it? Which is a bit strange if it, if it does. Let's grab something. Let's grab something over here. And have a look if we can do that. Right. To me, if I click on markup and it opens up the markup and I want to just, you know, mark that up in some kind of way. So let's go into there and make that much thicker. We'll have it in red and we will draw around that. That to me should be sufficient for that to know that I've marked it up. Let's hit save on that and go back and see if it is recognising it. It is. So now I'm on to the last bit, which is it wants me to replace a meeting with a video message. Um, somewhere there's a camera over here. Where's that camera gone? Oh, that's a hard drive. Can you see the camera, Mike? It's black in here. I don't I don't have the light on. Oh, hang on. There's a camera. No, it's not. There's another hard drive. <laughs> Where's the camera? Oh, there it is. It's in a box of hard drives. Right, OK. Like it is. Yeah, you know, like you do. Like you do. <clears throat> right, I've now got that pointing at the screen. This is going to get very meta, but let's give it a go. Replace a meeting with a video message. So in here, we'll do a screen recording and a camera. Right. So we'll just record a bit of the screen. I haven't got anything on here really to record, have we? But we'll just record that bit. And there it is. That there's my camera. So just to prove that's live, there you go. It's moving. I'm not turning it around any further. You know, it's a bad hair day. But there is my camera pointing at the screen and it's recording this. You can also see that the microphone's active, so it's recording that. But at this point, I'm not actually recording anything. I need to start the recording. So I hit the start button, get my countdown. The rest of the screen is now working. 
So I could bring something on very tiny, couldn't I? I could bring this across, see it appearing. And if I cover that bit up with it, oh, it's moving in slow motion. But you can actually see, you should be able to see it behind it as well. There you go. And if I shrink that down, so it's in that space there. This bit with the brown background is the desktop and this bit here is the camera with me saying how do you do do there we go I haven't got chicken I need chicken if I you we should have known they should have brought chicken up mm. uh, have I got anything else no I've got anything of Lola's probably got some dog treats somewhere but there you go so it's making a recording when you're ready to stop hit the stop button uh, it is going to Dropbox capture and it's uploading that and then I can rename it obviously down there uh, and again, you, this is where you share your thoughts, you've got the feedback, that's the whole point. So if I click on that, it will start playing. That wasn't actually 100% in focus, was it? And I didn't do it at the top quality and it looks like it needs flipping around as well. But apart from all of that, we have a recording. Point of which was to see if I get all, all my free space. So if I go up to there, there's the recording. It's not said it's done it yet, though. So I think I'll take another screen cap, just anything, and maybe that will kickstart it. No, it's not. I'll have to do another recording. But yeah, I think if you do it once or twice it, and you know, prove the point, then it will add. And in the end, you'll end up with 200 free. So, yes, that's what it does. To be honest, um, Dropbox and Google Drive are probably your best alternatives, but you really have to fight it these days to get a link that works the way that a Zite link does. But pCloud does some fantastic stuff in terms of the landing page that pCloud gives you is beautiful. The problem is trying to link directly to a graphic. And I think Tracy had this same issue as well. It's very difficult, again, to find the link. I got it working and then about four days later it died. So it's as though these links are only temporary and they don't, they've got to be permanent links. So the link that I put in into Obsidian. So let's go back to Obsidian. The link that I put in, this one here, if you actually look at the link, you can see eventually inside the link, there is a getcloudapp.com part of the link. And of course, that's going to cause me problems if they change it to getzite.com. They have said they will keep these links working because obviously people and businesses have got thousands and thousands of links and they don't really want to go through and deal with anything like that. Um, would it be catastrophic for me if they did? Well, if they change the .com part of that, the getcloudapp.com to zite.com, and that was all they did, the rest of it worked, then I'd be fine. I would do a global search and replace for getcloudapp.com and change it to zite.com. Could I do that in Obsidian? I wouldn't do it in Obsidian. I would go to a text editor. I would point it to my Obsidian vault and I would tell it to do a global search and replace. That's why one of the reasons that I use Obsidian, because I can do things like that. So throughout my Obsidian, I've got notes that are referring to Cloud App and you did, didn't you? And you changed it to Zite. Mm. If you change the name of a page, so if I had anything linked to this page and I change the name of that page, it, they will update. So in these notes here, if I wanted to refer, so I'm at the bottom of this here, if I wanted to refer to, so refer to square brackets and cunning plan like that, you may think, oh, I can't change the name of this because that would break. It depends how you do it. Don't change the link to the page go to the page which is here so if i go there and say cunning plan number two look in the top right hand corner updated two links in two files and when you look at the link it's updated it so if it's a page reference that's easy if it's part of a link like this it's a little bit more difficult but it can be done try doing that in evernote so, was that it for the questions? No, we've got two more coming. Oh, we've got two more now. Tracy wants to know, is there a rationale for us having two Dropbox accounts? I said a his and hers. Um, well, 
I've got some stuff shared with me from somebody else's Dropbox account, and you've got uh, access to a business account, yeah. haven't you? Um, to to keep to well, they used to be. Um, if you have like what they're giving away free these days, is it fifty gig? No two, idea. Two gig? Do you earn the gig? One option is to keep things separate. So maybe like a his and hers, like Mike's saying. Another option would be to have a secondary account where that is a backup and you only use it for backup. Another reason for having multiple accounts is rather than pay for the storage that you want, if you've got enough secondary accounts, you could build sort of 10 gig, 20 gig, and that might be all you need. Because I remember saying to Mike, 50 gig is fine. And we've ended up with three terabytes because it's that or nothing. So that's why we've moved the um, now the black hole will work on Dropbox. We've moved it back on there. The issue you would have with multiple Dropbox accounts is when you install the app, the Dropbox account app. So up here, I think I've got that running somewhere, haven't I? Come on, show it to me. Uh, or do I have it hidden? I have it hidden, but it shows up there as an icon. Right. The issue with that is you can only access one account at a time. So my primary, my, I only have one, but my primary Dropbox account is the only account that I can access. Now, if I had three more, because you have exactly the same problem with any of these apps that connect you to a cloud service. So it, the same is what I'm about to say is, is true of a Google Drive, OneDrive and PCloud. So and you know, add Dropbox to that mix. When you install the Conduit app that connects to that cloud, you can only access one account at a time. If you have Cloud Mounter, you can access as many as you like at the same time. So when my father was alive and he had a Dropbox account, why did we get him a Dropbox account? I can't remember. Oh, I know. Um, it was for all those maps and stuff for his friends, wasn't it? Oh, yeah. So... I created a Dropbox account for him, but obviously I couldn't log into it to put the files up there. I could share a folder from it, but I just found it easier to use Cloud Mounter and connect to it and be done. Cloud Mounter will let you connect. So if we go up to Cloud Mounter, which is also in there, this will let you connect to any number of drives. So you can see I am actually connected at the moment to the MapBytes S3. I am not connected to the Elaine Giles S3, but I, I have Elaine Giles S3 and MacBytes FM. If I wanted to, where's the new doodle? New drive, right. If you wanted to connect to another Dropbox account, if you had two or three or four, doesn't matter. All you need to do is to go into here and choose one and it will then connect you. So it will allow you to connect to it. Same with Google Drive. Same with um, OneDrive and pCloud is at the bottom. If your cloud service is not listed, go to your cloud service and get the instructions for how to connect via WebDAV and you can do a WebDAV connection to it, which is how I used to connect to, what was the one with the bird? Oh, a green bird, like a Swift. It looked like a Swift. Carol would know what bird it was. But I can't remember it. It's now defunct, but it never it never reached the dizzying heights of having like a name in here of its own. Um, but you could connect to it because there was a web dev connection. Another one is the old OmniSync server, which is also web dev. So you could connect to that. Uh, if, if that fails, then you've got an FTP at the top as well. But for me, the most important thing is Amazon S3 because Amazon S3 is a bit rustic in terms of it's very technical. So there is no client that I can install that will let me view my files in the cloud from my finder, apart from this one and expand drive. Um, so if you were using multiple accounts, that is what I would suggest. There's no harm doing that. And it's a great way to create backups. So that's what I do with OneDrive because OneDrive, if you have the, what's it called now, personal or family? Family, I think. The family thing, you can have, is it five or six? It's six, I think. Six. I think six, six different accounts. And each different account gets one terabyte of storage. So you actually, with your, I think we paid £46 this year, you actually get six terabytes of cloud storage. But you can only access one terabyte through the native client. The other five terabytes, you'd need something like CloudMounter or ExpandDrive to access the data. 
So hopefully that sorts that out. What else have we got, Mike? Uh, Carol wants to know if you still use craft for anything. Oh, and she also says, was it a parakeet? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was, oh, what is it? Called? Something sink it was called, and it had a bird. The bird was black and a Chrono bit of... Sink. No, no, that, well, that was an app, not a yeah. service. I've got a feeling it began with a B, but don't quote me. Look right. up cloud service, bird icon. It's going to annoy me now. I think a swift and a robin is the only birds that I know. Oh, and a pigeon. Oh, a parrot. Does a parrot count? If a parrot counts, I can tell a parrot. Um. So what was that? Do I still use what? Where's my... Uh, craft. Craft. Yes, I do. Um, craft has very good... Um. Well, as long as you ask it the right questions. It's got decent... Um. AI, and we use it for one specific job where the output is absolutely perfect. The trouble with Craft for me is I wouldn't want to replace Obsidian with it. It's too fiddly. It's a bit like Notion. You spend more time sorting out the app than actually creating the content, which in Obsidian I don't. I throw any kind of thing in Obsidian and I'll sort it out later. And with it being text only, I can do manipulations with it and stuff like that. But the one job that it absolutely is perfect for is our review of the year. So as we go through the year, we put stuff in it. But when it comes to getting that stuff out at the end, we were tr we were using Notion and it was hideous. The entire year was on one page. So you're talking about maybe 350, 400 links and stories with titles. And yes, you could fold it up, but there's no way you could get that out as HTML for a nice, pretty page, which Craft can do. So, yes, I've stuck with Craft. I don't like the new interface. They've they've changed the panel on the left and they've got so many complaints about it. It only makes sense to do what they do if you if you've got access to like 30 different spaces, which I don't. I've got access to my space and our shared space. So the new interface makes no sense whatsoever. But in terms of the app itself, it's a very, very nice app. It's Hummingbird. Just... No, it wasn't called Hummingbird. Oh. No. Oh. It, it had the word sync in its name. I'm oh. going to find this. It's going to upset me. There's another question. Right. It hit me with a question. From Patience. Could you potentially show us how to use pCloud if you find a method that does not break? Yes, I'll try. I'll do a demo of pCloud if you like. Um, some of the stuff that I've done with pCloud, when we did the video, you know, the Christmas video, that was where we put it because it was a nice landing page to put it. Um, also, when I did the boxed set of Marooned at Mark Bites headquarters, that was the best place to put it. Again, you could make a really nice landing page. Um, I will get onto them and, and see if you can get a link that, that lasts for more than five minutes. Sugar sink. Sugar sink. That was the one. See, it's a bird, isn't it? It's a green bird. Thank goodness for Google Images. <laughs> right, now share that with Carol and she'll tell us what kind of bird it is. It's feathers and a beak, so it's a bird. That's as, that's as good as I get, I'm afraid. Is that it for questions? Yeah. Right. Oh, Carol says she found encountered an app called Mem, which looks interesting. I've heard very, very good things about Mem, but I just don't want to change because I, I know it's shiny object syndrome and I wouldn't be able to take the notes with me because I don't do that. I think that that that's number one. We're, we're on to week two of building a second brain and we're still getting that question. Can I take my notes with me when I move apps? Why? When you buy a new notebook, do you fill it with all the stuff out of your old one? No, of course you don't. But people automatically want to do that. So I, I don't want to have to start again because it's not broken. So I'm sticking with it. I'm avoiding it. I'm avoiding it. It it's is a hummingbird. hummingbird. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Thank heavens for that. Now we know what bird it is. Right. OK, let's get that out of the way. And if we are done, go back into there. Oh, the behind the scenes sneak peek. Now my slides have stopped moving. There we go. Into my foray into YouTube shorts. Right. If you are not aware of what a YouTube short is, it's a video that YouTube have been promoting greatly for over a year now, I think. A good couple of years. Um, I don't think their big creators were really embracing it to the extent that YouTube would have liked. The reason that they brought in these videos, which are less than a minute and vertical, 
which is important for consumption. The idea is that these are not things that people will like get a notebook out and sit in front of their laptop to consume. They are quickly consumable. They're, they're the, um, what do you say? Um, TikTok of the adult world. Well, yes. TikTok and Instagram Reels are why we have YouTube Shorts. That's why. But the, but they are, um, let's say they're not the best food. They're the junk food. <laughs> they're a minute. Um, it, it, was in, it was a challenge as far as I was concerned to see, you know, could, could you put like a tutorial in a minute? Um, I'm going to send an email out, you know, and the title's going to be from the sublime to the ridiculous because we have had shows like plus five hours. Although where's Jammy? Jammy forgotten we're on again. Down the pub, probably. Yes. Um, you know, over five hours, and then to take that down to under a minute, could you learn something? So that was my challenge with my ship 30. So I tried it. I actually um, got some nice feedback. But the reason that I was sharing it uh, in this session is you would think it was easier, wouldn't you? And I had like, well, you know, what would be on the screen? Because if it's vertical, which is the biggest problem as far as I'm concerned, if it's vertical, how do I show the screen of an app? That was my biggest problem. Now, you don't need to show an app's interface in its entirety. And you've done a couple of shorts, haven't you? I've and done it, one short, yeah. it works. But well, you had a TikTok before that. Doesn't that count? No, because all I did was took a YouTube video and stuck it on TikTok. So it's the wrong ratio, the oh wrong my. orientation. Don't admit this. <laughs> I'm polite company. Mike has done one YouTube short then. Um, but Excel works great if you've got a list, if you've got a list of data. But the other thing that you'll see on here, and I will show you this live uh, in an edit, is just how much content you need to keep the visuals moving. Because whereas in a video you can get away with 5, 10, 20 seconds worth of static image like you're looking at now, you can't do that in a one minute short. It's like if it's not moving, it's broken. It's difficult. I swear it is difficult. So let me show you what that looks like for real behind the scenes. So I have put those in here, not in capture. You were in there. Right. So this is what I put together. First thing to notice is the first one I did was the new file dialogue. And when you look in there, look at all of that. Uh, there was no organisation because I didn't think it was worthwhile producing this in the way I would produce a video. And then I thought, what an unholy mess. <laughs> so that would really need tidying up. What we've got in there, there's inputs and there's outputs. These were the three screen recordings that I did. I ended up using about two seconds of one of them. The rest of them were static images. But I went through the whole process three times. <laughs> I would say I've learned, but, you know, probably not. Uh, then you need your vertical assets. So there is a vertical asset that I've got. I needed the poster for it. And I needed these step images. Now, you'll notice that these step images are just that. They are images. But in the video, they are moving. They are not video here, though. Then when I produce it, I produce it to a MOV. You can see that's like, I mean, it's one minute. So 707 meg. But then it needs to get crunched for upload. So that takes it down to 9.9. .9. There's very little difference between them to be honest, in terms of quality. But that's because I have the secret source to apply to the compressed video. If I were to go through the app and do that, so mine's a two step process. But if I were to go through the app, that file would probably have been about 30 meg. So my secret source makes it much, much smaller, which helps it upload faster and process faster. So that was the first one. Uh, this is the Camtasia project. And the second one is the pages, master pages. In this one, I decided I would put the assets in the assets and the audio in the audio. Uh, there is a mov in here somewhere. Uh, or is the mov somewhere else? Nope, there's the mov. And there's the Camtasia project. So the rest are assets. Uh, do I see a question? No. Right. OK. So I'll start off with the first one and then take you through the second one. So I'm opening up the Camtasia project. There are two types of Camtasia file. There is the Camproj file and there is, there is the T-Rec. 
The T-Rec is a TechSmith recording. So that's what these three are. But this one um, is the actual project itself. Do you know, anything could happen here at this point, couldn't it? Because I have got two versions of, well, I would have if it was taking any notice of me at all. Right, come on, let's open it with 2022 and do not crash. Simple instruction. Right. Oh, you are thinking about it indeed. Right. It doesn't usually take time, but I do have another version of Camtasia running that is recording. So as I say, anything could happen and that's why it's taking its sweet time. Not to mention the fact that everything crashed and burnt just before I was going live, which is better than it happening just after I'm going live, which it did on Monday, didn't it? Mm. Right. So what you're looking at in here, let's scoot this up so you can see all of the tracks. There are four tracks there and that's the canvas. So the first thing I did was script it. The first script that I did, I, I started talking. I, I'm looking at it. And I'm, you know, when you're reading it, but you're not actually speaking it. And I thought that should go in under a minute. And then I thought I could do with a stopwatch. And so I used an app on my phone, which is called, let's find it, it's called Timer Plus. And you can set multiple timers, but you can also have stopwatches. So I created a stopwatch. And that's the one that I used. So I pressed go and I started to read it out. Two minutes, 36. I thought that's not going to work. <laughs> so I needed to do two things. One, I needed to cut the script back to the bone. So any little explanation that I was going to throw in that no you've not got time that left me with about a minute 20 something like that and I thought well I'll just have to speak faster so I did and I was still over probably by about eight to ten seconds then in the edit literally I was brutal with it brutal so if I show you what the first one looked like that should be in here audio somewhere. Uh, don't see it separate. So what I'll do is show you down here. So this entire track is audio. You can see where I stopped for breath here, but those breaths were taken out. Literally stopping for breath in, in a short and you think it stopped. So they were, I thought, I, rather than try and speak it at the speed it was going to need to be done, which meant falling over myself, I did stop for breath and I thought I would take them out. So I took those out in the primary edit. You will see as you move along here, you can actually see the breaths. But when I came to this bit here, I'll zoom in so you can see it. Uh, come on to the right bit. That bit there. That stitch that you see wasn't taking out anything visual because this track is the audio. And if I'd spelt audio right, we'd be doing well, wouldn't we? Why didn't you point that out to me, Mike? Oh, the shame. Right. So this bit here had a silent bit and a breath. And this video was 58 seconds. So I needed to take the breath out. It really is to that level that you are taking things out to the level of a breath. You zoom in tight enough on here, you can do that though. So I only needed to take one out to get it to its final length of 57 seconds, just over 57 seconds. The rest of what you see in here, I went through the whole thing because even though I've said it and even though I've scripted it and even though there shouldn't be a problem, trust me, there always is. Right. I'm going to go into there and show you that you've got a quiz track and a marker track. And the marker track is where I put the markers to say what was coming up. So this bit here is me saying hello. Then there's the intro. Then there's three different ways. There's the one, the two and the three. And that was my sign off with try it and let me know. This one you can see is marrying up to this one in here. And the two is in the two and the three is in the three. Other than that, these markers are, are superfluous. I didn't export them or anything. They're not needed. It was just for me because you assemble this kind of video. You don't start with everything that you need ready and done. You assemble it and you're putting a lot of extra annotations and stuff on the top. 
So this bit here was the intro. And you can see that green arrow here. That is a transition and it is me. I have my favorite transitions here and it's me doing my custom transition here, where at that point that is 100 percent or 200 percent. When I move through this, it goes much bigger. It goes to like a thousand percent and disappears. And then we move into here and you can see the mouse is moving up there while I show you that you go to the new file dialog and then I move across that and we have another transition here. So I'm moving it so it's in the middle. Then we come on to this bit here, which I wanted a big visual to say this is step one. So that graphic started off, if we go down there, you can actually see it in the middle of the screen. But if we go to, let's click it, step one in here, it's at 3.7%. And as we go through the arrow, it goes up to 200%. It sits there for a fraction of a second, and then it goes even bigger and disappears off the screen, at which point the arrow comes on while I'm talking about the file new dialog here. Then you can see the bit behind here is going to move. It's moving across. And that's what this arrow is. So this recording here was a full screen recording. You can actually see it up here. I zoom out there. You can see that this is my window for the short, but this is the recording. So I'm moving it across. It started off more to the right and I'm moving it to the left as I go. And then I decided this was a bit I struggled with. I could not. You won't believe it, but I could not click on these options in here. So what I'm doing is I'm wanting to say there's the layout pages, color, margin and bleed. You cannot click that fast enough. So the video recording part of it finishes at that point there. This is a still image. That's a still image. And so are these. And the still images just so I can bring them in when I need them to be brought in. But you can't tell that that's not a video. Then I moved across to showcase this bit. So I'm showcasing that part there. And I did that with one of these sketch motions that draws around it. I then had a smaller sketch motion here that drew around the button underneath, while at the same time this one was fading out. Then we have the number two tiny in the middle. And I put exactly the same animation on as I did on the one and then it disappeared off. And then the line came on because I'm talking about templates. And I do believe at some point I can see a really long arrow here. I can see that there. So what I'd done at that stage, so you can see the top, I put another graphic on it, which is the cross and one which is the tick. They have got pluses next to them. Does anybody know what that means? Um, these were assets I already had created, so they're in my library. I've got a whole range of assets in here. I have no idea which bit they were under. Um, were you icons? Yes, you were icons. Cross and a tick. So those, because I used those in previous videos, that was a godsend. I just dragged them on. But if I dragged them on, there was actually a problem with them. If I drag that on, you can see it's transparent and I needed it to be white. I didn't bother scribbling it in. I put a white circle behind it. So that's why these are groups. So if I show you by clicking the cross, it opens the group and the group is two things. It's the cross and it's the shape. And if you don't see the shape, I didn't think that looked quite right. So that's why I put that in. And I put them together because they're always going to need to be moved together, as are these two, which is the tick, uh, the yes, the tick on the green background with the white behind it. And you can see what's happening behind. While I'm talking about this, the templates are moving across from the right to the left, taking their time doing it. But I wanted to get to that point there, which then took me on to point three. So that comes on, stays for a bit, disappears. Line comes on, points to the templates. Then you've got the same thing again, which is it starts to move from left to right. That's something that in a short you would need to do a lot because I can't even fit the dialogue box on. And I want to give the impression that that is moving. Is that video? 
No, it's not. It's a screenshot. That's just moving from left from right to left. The 10 is talking about the number of samples that you get for free. And then I wanted to say that to use those samples, you could download them and use them as is, or you could reverse engineer them. So at this stage, this video comes on, which is a transparent video sitting over the top of my Affinity Publisher background, but it's only half the video. If I showed you the, the actual video, there's two full bits to it. But there's no way again I could fit that on. So when you're picking video for a short, you need to pick something and all the video you will find will doubtless be in you know 4K or 1080p, but it'll be landscape 16.9. You're looking at it and you have to find a part of it, a sliver of it, that you know would work vertical. So I looked at that video and it had a blank bit in the middle for you to put some text in. And then it had gears on the left and gears on the right. And I thought, well, I'll just choose either the left or right and that will work. Then I said to you, didn't I, Mike, I want a bulb. Mm. And I found the perfect bulb. Um, one thing I had to do with my inspiration bulb, if I open up that, was I've got my text and I've got the bulb. But in here, you can see I've removed a colour. That was to knock the background out because it was on a black background. And I also increased the, the speed of that three threefold because it was so slow. And I thought, well, I've not got the time, not got the time for that. And rather than have a, the bulb sitting there moving incredibly slowly, I thought, well, I've got enough that I can change it. So all you do with that is you add a clip speed. So you would right click on it and you would say add clip speed. And in there, when you've got your clip speed, you can stretch it out. So you could run that at one. So if we run that at one, you'll see what I mean about the speed of it. Is it actually moving? Yeah, it was far, far, far too slow. So I thought, well, and another reason for changing the speed, I mean, in that case, it needed speeding up. But another reason for changing the speed is so you can get the whole video in and it will take up the amount of space that you need it to. I felt that was much better working faster. So that was what I did with that. And that was it for that one. And, you know, it's probably took me about 15 times longer to do it than explain it to you. <laughs> it took forever, I am telling you. Um, but it's a worthwhile exercise, isn't it? Are you watching them? Let me know and I'll show you the other one. Right. Um, oh, Carol says she didn't know you could rename the tracks. You didn't used to be able to, did you? And the other thing was you couldn't drag them around. Mm. The biggest nightmare was I always put the audio on the bottom and then edit to it. So everything else goes above that. I tend not to bother renaming the rest of the tracks because I just want it as small as possible in terms of the number of tracks. So things are grouped on here. I do name all of the bits on here. But I don't want the number of tracks to get to like 25 and, and it's scoot up here because then I, I, I literally can't see what I'm editing. But they added in the ability that you could pick up a track and move the track. Oh, at last. I couldn't believe you couldn't do that. What you had to do to fake it was literally select everything on a track, move it to another track and then move it back. Oh, it was hideous. So, yes, that, that is a huge bonus. And the other thing that you can do, which is great when I do name the tracks. Now, audio is fine because it's only a you know small word. But if you hover next to this now, you can widen that. Oh, at last. So if I do put a longer name, I can actually see it. It does twang back. You know, you can't set it as a default, but you can do it. And the other thing is this way you have the marker or the quiz track. I think you do the same, don't you? But I do use the markers, but then I have to turn them off because if I don't, I find I'm constantly adding markers here all over the place that I don't want. So if I fold that up, I can see where my markers are. I can't see the title of them, but I'm not inadvertently adding markers all over the place. Do I spot a, ca a question there? Yes. If the voice drops lower in an audio file, can you make it louder for just that part? Yes, you can. So if we take part of this, this is really cool. All right. So let's say that bit there. This happens a lot when you've got two people talking. If I stretch that out, that is selecting in here just that part. 
and then anything I do is going to happen to just that part. So in there, you can see up here, this, this annoys me. They have an application called Audiate and it's subscription and it's an arm and a leg. We're talking hundreds. I don't want to be advertised to in here. So I keep putting that down and they keep twanging it back. I have complained. <laughs> Probably going to get nowhere. Right. So in here, this is where you've got your gain and it's set to 100 at the moment. So if it's too quiet, you want to take it up. You, that's doing it to all of it. What are you doing? You should not be doing that. <gasps> Don't make a liar out of me. Come on. Well, I can do it in there if I can't do it in there. So you see that moving down to 20 percent or up as high as I want it to go. So the trick is in here to make a selection. And then when you move into here and you start moving it, you are only moving it for that selection. Other thing that you might want to consider. So let's take that back and make it like 160 is when you are in here, what that has actually done, if we move away from it and deselect um, with your audio selected, you can see this is your if I move that to there, I'm in between these two. I call I call them balls, but they're actually envelope points. Um, these can mark and in, these are marking the in and out of your change. You can add those manually if you want. So let's say this bit here, we considered that to be a bit loud. This just this in here. This is what I would do manually. So let's say we want to reduce that, but you don't want it down to nothing. So we're all right up to that point. So I've double clicked and it puts a ball on it. I will double click next to it. And I'm going to double click where that is correct. So let's say that the, the level from that point on is OK. We don't want to adjust anything to the left of that point. And we don't want to adjust anything to the right of that point. Hence the three balls. This one can then be manipulated. So you can take that right down if you want. You can move it. And you can get it just right. So we probably want that about there. And that is what that looks like. So you can do amazing things with the audio. How I do the audio, I do nothing with the audio in here. There is one option that you may want to consider when you come to producing it, which is to go when you go to export, I make a local file. Now it's having another rare old think about it. And in the options in here, you can enable audio smoothing. And that will, you know, if there's any peaks or troughs in it, it will try and smooth it out. I do leave that on because I'm considering it's doing nothing because I've already done the audio. I record the audio in Audio Hijack. I edit it in Twisted Wave and I then take it through Hindenburg and make it the right um, luffs. So it's a minus 16, although YouTube, I think, says minus 14. We use minus 16, which is a podcast standard. So that audio, by the time it gets into Camtasia, is already optimised. But there may be the odd thing that I'm bringing in, maybe like a sound effect or something, and I want to do something with, and that is how you do it. So do we have any other questions on that? Uh, no. Richard said he enjoyed them. Thank you. Thank you. I, I will carry on with this. I will persevere with it. I will make it faster. I swear I will. Right. So that was the first one. Don't need to save anything in there. Second one was a little bit different because I then decided, no, I don't want to open you. Definitely not. I've got a demo version. We're opening the demo version, not the original. Right. Pages and master pages. I decided with this one it needed more movement. Um, I don't think it needed much in the way of bing bong music or anything like that. Are you opening or are you only thinking about it? I don't think you're even thinking about it. Let's do an open. And there we go. Um, I decided it could do more movement because the movement isn't as overwhelming as sounds on the soundtrack because you don't know everybody's um, experience in terms of how good their hearing is. Some people detest music, some love music, but I thought, the ones that detest it, you can't take it away. So what I can do is make the thing have more movement so you're not missing the audio. So in this one, 
Uh, and I did use some stock images here. So this one had five tracks. And I spelled audio correct. <laughs> Woohoo. Right. So that is my timeline on this one. It looks like there's more. There probably is, actually. The beginning was very similar, where I've just got what it is and what we're talking about. That zooms out. Then I go into the pages. So I'm pointing with the arrow at the pages. Again, you can see I've got far more of the screen not shown than I have shown. And because I was only using the interface for this, all I actually did was take a screenshot um, of a file of the file that was open after Monday night, hence it being the church newsletter. Then I drew round two things. I'm drawing around the master pages at the top. That is actually inside Camtasia. So if you wanted to do that, it's in the annotations and you go to the squiggle there. And it is that one. You can see that's yellow. You can change all of that. So these that I've got here have their own properties over here. And the colour I've picked from up there and I changed the thickness of the line as well. But they are built in here. You can have happy smiley faces and everything. I have never used these before. I know you have, haven't you? Mm. I have never used it. Have you only ever used the, the square or do you like put stars on it and stuff? Uh... There's a I've smiley. The arrow. There's a smiley face and a sad I face. Have used, yeah, I've used the bendy arrow. No, this is the only one I've ever used. This one, and there's even two options. I wanted mine to be quite perfect as a square, but you can have it, you know, much more hand drawn looking if you want. But they are already built in there, and you can make your own if you want. All of these you you can customize in any kind of way you want. So that went round the top one for the master pages, and the bottom one for the standard pages. Uh, and then in here, I used the background that I had at the beginning, which I needed to create. But this is just that demo file from the church newsletter. I took a screenshot of it and scooted it down to 90 percent and just said it, it contains content. It was just Laura Mipsum. And then we moved out of that into the master pages. This is where it got trickier because with the master pages, there's nothing to see, is there, until you add the content to it. So what I did with that was I put master pages at the top and then as I started explaining it that we had page numbers, the page numbers came up from nothing and stopped and then moved down to where they would be. And then there was a little bing bong, a boing as it landed. And I added the same for the running headers. I added the same for the brand and the same for the logo. But this bit here doesn't look like much is happening. It says overlays, but it doesn't look like much is happening. These lines that you see in it, there should be four of them. These lines are the sound effect. So there's actually to do something as simple as that, which was from 16 seconds to 21 seconds. So you're looking at five seconds on the screen. If I open it up, you'll see just how much was involved. It was actually quite difficult to create. So this bottom one is the page number and I've got the transitions happening with it. So it comes in and it stops in the middle and then it scoots down to where it is. And then that little bit there, which you really can't see. Let's go in. That's the bong. Bubble something. It's a bubble pop sound effect. So that is just at the beginning as that is finishing and then rinse and repeat for all of the others and you end up with something like that. And that's what I mean when I say you don't want another five tracks on your main timeline. So I wrap those up in the overlays. I could have taken this much further. I could have wrapped up the whole of that, uh, those four bits there. I could even have added that in with this and this. I don't take it that far in case I need to edit because it makes it a little bit more difficult to edit. Um, then I came on to two different things, which was this. So in the background, those pages are moving. They are flipping over. You see pages turning. What's happening here is I have graphics with a transparent background. These are not graphics where the blue bit and the orange bit are separate. That's one. That's the next one to say you can have as many pages as you like. Then we've got master pages on master pages. Yeah, I think there were three, weren't there? Uh, these, as I was thinking about it, it's like sometimes it's easier. People people say with note taking apps, I want one note taking app. Good luck with that because one note taking app can't do everything. 
that's why I have craft and that's why I use Notion and that's why I've got Obsidian. I've also got good notes. Evernote's still sticking around somewhere. So I looked at it and I thought the problem with that to get consistency across these three foreground images would have been more difficult in here than it would be if they were graphics. So they were graphics. So they were made in Affinity Designer. You weren't it. <laughs> that was me making the poster image. Um, I will go and find the image and I will show you. Uh, Affinity, there we go. Assets Master Pages go and open with the right version. So I deliberately used in here, I actually made four, but I only needed three in the end. I deliberately made these in here. And the benefit of that was I could make sure that, that these were grouped and centered. These are in exactly the same place as are these, as are these. And then I created these two little icons. Um, the infinity sign came from the emojis and it's just sitting on top of a square. And because the artboard had no colour to start with, if we look at all the artboards in here when they're folded up, there is no background colour. They're transparent. When I came to export them, they were going to export with transparency as long as the file format supported transparency. So I exported them as PNGs and I got the transparency. That is where they came from. Now, how I did that in here, because I was all for doing it manually, because I'd never done this before. But if I go into File New, I was looking in my web options. You know, I've got 720 by 1080. I've got 1080 by 720. All kinds of things in there. Um, it was actually called Story Media, um, Social Media Story Post. And it happened to be the right size, which is 1080 <coughs> by 1920. I did have a play around with turning it on its side, the other one, and that didn't end well. So I picked that one. And I set it to 144, which is Retina. So I didn't need to create a new preset. Will I create a template? Yes, because in the template, I would be able to put standard stuff that's in here. Now, this one wouldn't have had anything standard in it anyway. But things like the background and stuff like that, I do have them available as assets over here, but they're not the right size. So sometimes you can take, sometimes it's worth it. It, dep it depends on the circumstances. But I have created, um, let's say new um, template. I've created in here for the posters, some of YouTube posters here. I've created a template that's the furthest I've ever taken a template. So the first thing I do, that's there just for branding. So I get rid of that. Don't Don't want anything in there. You can see that that is set up for Affinity Publisher. But what if I wanted an Affinity Designer one? Mm. What if I wanted photo? And while it doesn't take a lot to drag these on and change them, you know, you do have to rescale them all. You could have multiple templates. But the problem with that is when you come to export, you want your exports, of which I have quite a lot, to be standard and not have to be changed in 27 different places. So I sat there and I thought, mm, I would love it if I could put this in one template. And I did that with snapshots. You want it to be Affinity Designer? Just click on that and apply it. Now it's Affinity Designer. You want it to be Photo? Now it's Photo. Oh, so what I need is something as advanced as that for my shorts, and that will cut down the time it takes to do that. OK, so that's what we did in there. I exported them as images. So if we go into the media, you will actually see them as images. There they are. Infinite um, master page on master page and standard page based on a master page. And they were just put in there. This is a graphic um, a video that I got from Envato. So it is a brain. You'll probably see this one again. It's the only one I could find. I was looking for mind blown. And the next thing I did was put that in. And if you watch, there is a video coming across it, which has a background transparency and it's saying it's like magic, you know, it updates magically. The rest of that is pretty similar to the last one. The interesting point is this bit here. These page turning, the page turning video, it, that's on screen for quite a while. That is there as a background from 21 seconds all the way up to 
52. So what I needed to do with that, I'll show you. That's why it's in a group and it says 13 clips. It's the same clip. Seriously, it's the same clip. Luckily, at the end of that clip, if, you, if I just press play now, it will go over that bit and you won't be able to see the join. So I bumped them up next to each other. I got them to the speed they wanted to be. So I've got that speeded up a bit. I wanted the pages moving for a start and then just put the number I needed on the timeline to finish it. Um, once it's in a group of its own like this, if at the end there's like a gap, I can just put another one and it will fall into this dark area, which means it's there, but you're not using it. So it won't cause any problems. So it worked out beautifully. You can you can do that with any kind of clip like that. You do need to check when you're getting the clip. It will say, is it loopable? Now, this one said it wasn't loopable. But when I put two of them next to each other, you couldn't see the join. So it didn't matter. But if you're if it if it desperately needs to loop properly, then when you're looking for your assets, make sure that you pick a loopable one. And that was it. So go and go and watch them. Please go and watch them, because trust me, it took more than a minute to put them together. <laughs> What was I thinking when I had this grand idea of doing a series of videos? Mm. How long could it take? I thought there a minute. I thought, yes, I'm hoping by the end of it, um, I will have templates like the advanced template that I showed you and everything will be coming together much faster. The other thing that I will have, of course, is instead of taking a standard um, annotation and recolouring it every time, I'll put that in the library. I will know which of these assets I need in the library and which can live externally. So although I've got Eagle, sometimes it's faster to have them in the library in here. So if we go into the library in here, I have multiple libraries. This is the default, but there's a whole range of them there. So in my default one, I have icons that I use. I have full screen stuff. Um, I have fixes. So when I record, uh, Monty has a slightly different menu bar color to Biggles. And if the menu is not active, it's that color. So I have three of those because when I record, like I'm recording right now, all of this stuff is up in the menu bar. Usually I don't want to see that. So I put these in here. Then I've got highlights and focus. I've got annotations. So I've got my arrows and I've got my outlines and all kinds of stuff. They're all the right color and they're all ready to go. So I've picked a font for those that's called Anton. So um, it's very narrow, which means I can get a lot of text in without having to make it that small that you can't see it. So at the end of this process, hopefully um, I'll be able to show you a template where it, it does itself. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? At Camtasia GPT, that'd be good. Do we have any questions? Yeah, well, one from Richard. Mm -hmm. I like the exploding brain. Is there any software you could use to recolor a video? Looks like to a, have blue a blue brain. brain. Right. Where's the where's that? Here we go. So there's the exploding brain. Right. You have available over here. I, I use the favorites a lot. I have put the things that I use a lot in there. The media contains the media that is in this video and the brain is part of that. So you can see that at the top. And as you move through that, it will even preview it. The rest of the stuff in here, I have stuff set in the library, but all of these things, like you've got visual effects, you can apply different colours to them. So if I drag that onto the brain, you can see it's made it that kind of duotone colour. So there is my colour tint. I'm going from a lighter tone to a darker tone. So if I set that to the same tone, uh, I don't know whether we're going to get a blue brain, might we get a purple brain. Um, I probably need longer than I've got here to do that, but that's one option. You could set that to the same colour and you get definitely get a different effect. That's the colour tint option. You've also got the fact that you can colourise it. So now we've got a, a green and, oh dear, that looks like yoghurt brain. So what's happened with that? We've got the colourise option at the bottom and it's applied green to it. So I could change that to blue. Um, we got pink. Could I get what would I have to apply to that to get a blue brain? Uh, I can get it that color. 
I don't think you're going to get that blue with that, but you can colorize it. So if I decided I wanted it, you know, why would I want it that color? There you go, I like that color. Then I can colorize it from there. Uh, you may be able to make some changes in here with all of this and, and tweak it. I must admit that is not something that I have done. But you can see if you address the blue midtones or the green ones, you get a totally different effect. So colorize is an option as well. What else did we have in here? There's a lot of stuff that they added here because they want to push this to video editors, not just screencast users. Uh, I think they're probably your best bet. I have used the colour adjustment before today. So what the colour adjustment does, it makes it black and white before you start. And then you start tweaking it. So happy days at the beginning of COVID where I was getting a very ropey coloured video from the deacon who'd recorded the priest. <laughs> Don't ask. Um We've, we've got streaming now at the church, thankfully. But I would get this video and it'd be very washed out because we've got beautiful windows at our church and they always seem to be recording it at like high noon. And the light was coming through the windows and the colours were shocking. So I applied this, which does take all the saturation out. So it's taking the saturation down to nothing. But you can bring that up and you can take it as much as you want. Obviously, what I was trying to do was to get something mediocre, something that looked reasonable, um, altering the brightness and stuff like that. Now, you could use this like I've made that much darker now. If I now applied a different colorize to it, because you can you can add more than one. Now we have a green brain that's looking quite hopeful if I colorize that with blue. It's a bit purpley, isn't it? Is that more blue? Like that. Um, in the color adjustment here, if I I can change the contrast a bit, get that different colors. That's making it more cyany blue. And I can adjust the brightness and then that's changing the background as well. But I think I'm about right with the brightness. And then the saturation just depends, you know, what kind of color you want with it. But that's not bad. I, I Can I qualify that as being a blue brain? Yeah. And there you go. So is, is, is that something like you're after? <laughs> OK. What else have we got? Uh, one from Patience. Do you have any Eagle tutorials on how to reconnect your library when you change storage destinations? You shouldn't have to reconnect it. Uh, all you should need to do, I would close Eagle before I started, is move it and then open the library from there. Just open it from there. I don't think we did that in the tutorial, but I'm contemplating um, more sessions on Eagle because it's so deep, isn't it? I have no idea how I lived before Eagle. I think I've got seven and a half thousand images in there and they're all from the sessions I do and stuff like that. So you shouldn't really have to reconnect to it. Just take away the link and open up the new library. So just say open library from and point it to the new location. Right. OK, Richard's happy with that. Excellent. Right, we've got you next. Are you ready? Right, I will be when I've set up my screen and hit record. You'll be ready shortly. Sequencing gears. Well, I get the last two demos ready. Uh, keep putting your questions in. Um, you've got me now while Mike's talking. Right. Lucky, lucky folk. <laughs> I'm right. ready. Hang on, let me let me get you shared your screen. Oh, you've hidden your desktop. That's just as well. Usually frightens people. Right, away you go. Shall I start? Yes. Okay. Right, I thought I would cover today the sequence function in Excel. It's one of the fairly new functions. Uh, it was brought in two years ago and it's only available to Office 365 users. Now, what it does is it allows you to generate a sequence of numbers or a sequence of dates. So my first thought when I saw it was why do you need to do that because as i'm sure you know if i select here a1 and a2 which i've put one and two in point the mouse at the bottom corner get the little black cross and drag down and i can drag down as many as i like it generates sequential numbers if i select b1 and b2 and do the same thing get the little black cross by pointing at the bottom corner of B2, then drag down, 
and I get sequential, it's not sequential numbers, but it's taking the interval uh, between the first two. So you're getting the, the repeat of 5, 10, 15. If I do the same thing here, select um, C1 and C2, get the little black cross, drag the mouse down. What it does there is it starts at 20, goes down in intervals of one, and you can see it stopped at minus five only because I stopped at C26. You can do the same thing with dates as well. So here I've got um, two dates there, seven days apart. Point at the bottom corner, drag down, and I now get a set of dates seven days apart. So that was my first thought. Why would you need to use a function? What, what use is a function when you can do that manually? You've always been able to do that manually. And you can go across. I've done going down a column, but you can go across. Simon's well, Simon's got a fabulous question. If I put the names of my first two girlfriends in the top boxes and drag down, will it name all the others? No, but what you can do, Simon, is probably go to ChatGPT. <laughs> no, 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 you could create a custom list. You course. could create a custom list, but you'd have to give it the names of all the girlfriends because it's not that clever. No, and, and how many rows are we talking about? Let's get him in trouble with Mrs. Simon. <laughs> Could it be over the 1,048,576? Oh, my. Simon, really? <laughs> you walked straight into that one, Simon. <laughs> OK, so let's get back to serious stuff, shall we? And Simon's girlfriends. <laughs> right. Uh, so, yeah, let's let's start with how the function works. Um <laughs> And then I'll show you. Off now. Put me off now. Yeah, I'll show you a couple of a couple of use cases. So um, I'm going to go to a one, and I'm going to put equals sequence, and the sequence function takes four parameters. So the first parameter is the number of rows. So in this one, I'm going to say I want ten rows, then a comma, and I want one column. So it's going to create an array or a block. Simon can't remember, he says. So uh, more, more than 55 rows. Oh, no, he's 55 now. So I was misreading that. Sorry. I, I thought you said more than 55 rows, Simon. OK, fine. <laughs> walk away, yes, leave it walk alone. Away. The pair of us walk away and get back to this demo. OK, so I'll stop looking at the chat as well. Um, so... 10 rows, one column. I want to start at one and I want it to go up in steps of one. If you want it to go down in steps, use a negative there. But here I want it to go up in steps. So what it does is it does what I've asked it. It generates sequential numbers starting at one, going up in steps of one, one column, 10 rows. You'll notice that there's a blue border around that range. You'll also notice that the only formula that can be edited is the one in A1. All of the other formulas are greyed out. Um, and that is what's called a dynamic array function. So if I changed my mind and I went up and edited the formula, I've got to edit the one in A1. The others can't be edited. And I'll change that one to 12. And automatically it increments and now we've got uh, 12 entries. If I go and change that to a minus one, that's the step one. Then you can see it's starting at one, going in steps of minus one, and it's one column and 12 rows. There's actually some default settings. So if I delete that, by the way, when you have a dynamic array function, it's basically a whole set of formulas in one cell. So if I wanted to delete all of those, I actually can go to the first one and press delete and they've all gone. So, yeah, there's some default settings. So if I put um, equals sequence and then just put 10, I'm telling it I want 10 rows. If you don't tell it how many columns, it defaults to one. If you don't tell it the start number, it defaults to one. And if you don't tell it the step number, 
it defaults to one. So at a minimum, if I just put sequence 10, it generates 10 rows, one column starting at one, going up in steps of one. What I'll do now is go over to C1 and put equal sequence. And let's say I want five columns on one row. I can either put one comma five, but because one is the default, I could miss that out and put comma five. You have to put the comma because if I just put five, it's going to think that that's the number of rows, which isn't what I want. So I need to put a comma to indicate the first parameter is missing and therefore it's going to use the default, which is a one. So one row, five columns. So you can have it going across as well as have it going down. If you're thinking, by the way, what's the point of this? Pretty much um, as I was thinking when I first started looking at it, I will show you some real life examples. But at the moment, it's just a case of understanding how the thing works. So if I go over to I1 and put equals sequence and here I'm going to put 10 comma 5, which means generate 10 rows and five columns. And there we get 10 rows and five columns. Um, you'll notice that it's going uh, across and then down. I will show you how you can get it going down and then across. But at the moment, the default is to go across. So one, two, three, four, five, then the next row, six to 10, then the next row and so on and so forth. And over here, do, 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 do. yeah, I'll do it over here. Over here, I'm going to put equals sequence five comma five comma two comma two which means generate a block of five columns five rows starting at two and going up in increments of two you've just made simon's night have i mm. oh you can reference a cell and then use that as the basis of the expansion yeah okay yeah, it is. It's, it is great for calendar stuff. And um, I've, I've got an example of a calendar. I've got a couple of examples of calendars. Um, can you nest the sequence function in an if statement? Yeah, you can do that, Richard. Um, it's just a function, so it can be, you know, it can be nested in pretty much any, uh, any other function, particularly uh, an if function, as you're saying. So for that one, for that one, I've done a five by five but starting at two and incrementing in two. So the step, the step is the increment. Um, as you say as well, Simon, um, use a cell reference as the, as the increment. Use the cell reference for any of those parameters. So if I just go up to 02 and put five, and then I go and edit the formula and I replace that, to there, that last parameter, with 01, not 02, 01, then what it's doing is it's going up in fives. If I go and change that to a, a six, it's now going up in sixes. So it's using that cell, as you've already tested, I guess, Simon, as the, uh, as the incrementer. Okay, now, as I've just shown you, in a multi-column array, so this is a multi-column array here, that's a multi-column array there. In a multi-column array, by default, the sequence works left to right and then top to bottom. But what if I wanted it to work top to bottom? So I'll delete that out and in A14, I'll put equal sequence uh, 10, comma, five. So give me 10 rows, five columns. If you wrap the sequence function inside the transpose function, then it flips it. So I'll go and edit the function and I'm going to use the transpose function. So it's two functions, one nested inside the other. So equals transpose. What the transpose function does on its own 
is it flips round whatever is inside the brackets. Well, what's inside the brackets here is a sequence generator. So if I press enter, now what we've got is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, etc. So instead of going across, it's going top to bottom. If I just undo that, so you can see it again. So the default is left to right, then the next row left to right, then the next row left to right. But if I wrap the sequence inside a transpose, then it's going down top to bottom, then the next column top to bottom, etc. The only problem with that is it's changed the shape. So instead of being 10 rows and five columns, it's now 10 columns and five rows. So what I'll do is I'll change it. I'll just flip these two numbers around here. So instead of 10 comma five, it's five comma 10. So that's not a comma, that's a full stop, five comma 10. So that's now gonna generate me five rows and 10 columns. Like that, sorry, wrong way around. That's generating me, um, that's generating me five columns, 10 rows. Normally it would be five rows, 10, five rows, 10 columns, but because I've used transpose, it's flipped it around. Okay. Now the last bit here, before we move on to, to look at dates, which I think Annie mentioned about calendars is Roman numerals. So equals Roman open brackets, the Roman function, it's probably one of the least used functions. It just generates Roman numerals. Um, I'm sure somebody somewhere has used it and has a need to use it. Um, but out of the 500 of functions, it's one of those that's very obscure and hardly ever used. But if I put in here sequence and I just put in, um, say 10, so that's going to generate me 10 rows. I'll need another closing bracket to match the opening one of the Roman. There we go. So that is the Roman numerals one to 10 in sequence. So Simon, if your girlfriends were called I, 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 and I, V and V and so on, then yes, you could. <laughs> okay. Now dates, let's have a look at dates. Uh, don't see any more questions. So let's go and have a look at dates. <coughs> so you were talking about ship 30 before. So you started on the 8th of April, didn't you? Yep. Ship 30. So I've just typed 8th of April into A1 and you're doing 30 essays. Yep. So what I want to do starting in A4 is I want to generate 30 dates. So I'll put equals sequence or search pick the right function equals sequence the number of rows is 30 rather than me typing 30 i'll pick it up from a2 comma the number of columns is one the start is the 8th of april which is in a1 and the step is one and press enter and there you go now, what it hasn't done is it hasn't formatted those dates. So it's just used the date serial numbers. So I'll have to select those manually and then go and just apply a long date. If I was to change that to 35, so if you decided to carry on and do another 30, another five essays after your 30, it automatically continues the sequence. But again, it doesn't carry the formatting down. Let's look at another example. OK, so 16th of March 2020. That date rings a bell. What date was that? 16th of March. That was the first marooned. That was the first marooned indeed. And we originally were only going to do five marooned. So I want to get the dates. <laughs> that ended well. <laughs> I want to get the dates of those marooned. So I'll just put equals sequence, open brackets. I want the number of rows coming from C2. I want one column. I want to start on the 16th of March or whatever's in C1. And I want to go up in steps of one. And I will I'll um, just format them. I'll format a few more 
cells here like that and then once we'd done the first five we thought that's a good idea let's go and do another five so uh, let's have 10 dates and now that's generated 10 dates and so on and so you know if I put like 500 it would generate 500 dates they're not formatted but as I'm sure you know behind a date is just a serial number and what I can also do in column D is I can get it to generate the day number. So welcome to Marooned at Map Hikes headquarters, day five. I forgot to say that last time. Did you? Mm. Oh, well, do you want to say it now? Well, now might be a good time to mention that, that we may or may not have a reunion coming up. May we? Oh, we do. Day? Uh, well, I have no idea what day it'll be, but... <laughs> No, I know what day it is, but I don't know what day number it is. Right. Well, I so can, keep your eyes out I can on work the mail. It out for you. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to put equals, and then the word day, and a space in double quotes, ampersand, and then sequence, and C two. So what I'm doing is I'm picking up, I'm telling it to put the word day in there, followed by the day number, which is going to generate sequential numbers like that. So day one, day two, and so on. That will take it all the way down to day 500. But if I change that to 10, it just takes it to 10. OK, let me give you another example. So here, in uh, in column F, um, lockdown marooned was awesome, says yeah, we uh, had great Simon. Fun. Yay! Um, so in column F, I want to generate a list of work days. Sorry, weekdays, not work days. I want to generate a list of weekdays, thirty weekdays, starting the seventeenth of April and ending on whatever the 30th is. So again, let's imagine that you were doing your ship 30. You were going to write 30 atomic essays, but you were only going to write them on the weekdays. I don't think that's how it works, is it? Sadly not. But, no. <laughs> let's imagine. <laughs> let's imagine that's what you were going to do. So you need to know the actual days. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the workday function. The workday function calculates the date that is a certain number of days after a given date. So one day from the 17th of April, two days from the 17th of April, three days from the 17th of April and so on. But the workday function ignores the uh, weekends. It assumes Saturday and Sunday. Now, there is another function there's workday international if you need to specify custom weekends. So what I'm going to do here is if I just put in uh, in F2 equals work day, the start date is going to be F1, comma, and if I just put a two, what that will do, and I'll need to format these cells for it to make any real sense, what that will do is that will give you the 19th of April, because the 19th of April is two work days away from the 17th. If I change that to 8, it gives us the 27th of April. Now, of course, the 27th of April is 10 days from the 17th, but we're excluding the weekends. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to change this formula to be equals workday, open brackets, F1, comma, and then... To calculate the number of days, I'll use the sequence function. And if I just say sequence 30, it will default to one as the column. So I just want one column. It will default to starting at one, which is what I want, because I want it to start with one day after the 17th of April, and it will increment in steps of one. And I have missed out a closing bracket. So get Brackets it blind. Bracket blind. Bla 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 bracket blind. And the teeth. Good there grief. You go. So 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Then 22, 23 is the Saturday, Sunday. And then that's the next five days. And then you've got two days, etc., etc. 
Okay. So, um, Annie says she's going to have to look at all these extra functions that have totally passed you by. Yeah, Microsoft have thrown in a load of new functions to 365 users over the past year or two, uh, including Lambda that Richard and I were talking about earlier. I did a session on Lambda a long time ago. Might have to do it again. Okay, so how 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 are you doing for? Oh, I'm fine. Okay, I'll carry on then. Okay. Yes, I'm still awake and everything. Right. Okay. Um, right. This is a. Uh, they call this a waffle chart. I did a video about waffle charts um, ages ago, because it's it's named after the the Belgian waffle because it's basically little little squares that are optionally coloured. So what I've done here is I've created a representation of a fictitious parliament. So rather than getting into real party politics, uh, what I've done here um, is I've created um, a pink party, a yellow party and an orange party. And these are the number of seats that each party has won in our 97 seat parliament. So Patience says, are these available in all versions of Excel? They're available Patience in 365, even the free version of 365. So if you've got 365 on Windows or the Mac, because I'm using the Mac version tonight, uh, you'll have them. If you're using the standalone version of 2021, you'll have them. So the best thing to do, if you're not sure, is... Go to a blank cell and type equals SE and just see if sequence appears in the list. If it's there, great, you can use it. If it's not, then no, in your version of Excel, it's not available. So it's available if you've got 365, it's available in the desktop version. It's available in the uh, iPad and iPhone version, and it's also available in the web version. OK, oh, we are getting into party politics, so I'm going to keep away from that. So, as I said, pink party, yellow party, orange party. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to generate this grid. So all I did is I just did a is use the sequence um, function to generate a 10 by 10 grid. Um, just seeing what uh, Simon's put. You you were always frustrated at the differences using the Mac version. It has it has improved vastly, Simon. Um, you know a lot of the functions now that are available in the Windows version, particularly the three six five ones, are also available here. And Power Query is now also available in uh, for three six five users. I think that's now in general availability. It used to be in uh, in beta preview only. So yeah, what I've done is I've generated a 10 by 10 grid like that. And then I've used conditional formatting. So that's what these from and to are for. The from and to are there to be able to apply the conditional formatting. So if I select those cells there, go to conditional formatting and show you the rules. The rules are saying if the value is between what's in um, O2 and what's in P2 um, is, I need to widen this, sorry, O2 and P4. So if the value uh, is between what's in O2 and P4, I can actually just edit that rule. Yeah, if the value is between what's in O4 and what's in P4, which is those two, then color it orange if it is between O3 and P3 which is those two color it yellow and if it's between O2 and P2 color it pink. So I used basically variables for the conditional formatting. So let's say the pink party at the next election lost a load of seats and they ended up with 20 seats and the yellow party ended up with 65 seats and the orange party ended up with uh, 12 seats. You can see how it updates automatically. And these are just left white because 
Um, we only have 97 seats in our parliament. Now, I don't actually want to see the numbers, so I'm going to highlight the numbers and then click on the drop down in general, go to more number formats, go to custom and type three semicolons. I call it the semicolon trick, which hides the cell contents. So that way you can actually just see the colors without the distraction of the numbers. Okay, I'm gonna do one last demo. One of the problems with the sequence function is not being able to provide a stop value. So I want to generate values one to 96. So what I'll do is I'll put equals sequence eight comma 12 and it generates one to 96. Or I could swap those around. I could do 12 comma eight. I still get one to 96. Or I could do 24 comma four. I still get one to 96, just in, in different sized dimensions. All of those need me to know my times table. But one, one, what if I'm not good at maths and I don't know my times table? And two, what if I needed to generate one to 97? Dividing 97 by a whole number doesn't result in a whole number. So the best I could do is 98, because that's the next even whole number. Or what if I wanted a square and not a rectangle? So here I was saying I could have a 12 by 8 or an 8 by 12 or 24 by 4. But what if I was told I had to have a 10 by 10 grid? So if I do equal sequence 10 comma 10, I've got one to a hundred, but I don't want one to a hundred. I want one to 98. That's the requirement. One to 98 in a 10 by 10 grid or one to 97. I'll do 97. One to 97 in a 10 by 10 grid. The solution is to use another function. And the function is called the wrap coals function. There's wrap coals and wrap rows. What wrap calls does is converts a one dimensional array, so i.e. a one column array, into a two dimensional array, so a multi column array, by wrapping values into separate columns. So if I do this equals wrap calls, and what I want to wrap is sequence 97 because I want it to generate 97 rows, but I want it to wrap it into blocks of 10. And where I have the additional, um, in this case, 98, 99, 100, I want it to put spaces in. So just double quote, double quote. And you can see what I get. I actually get, instead of 97 columns, from top to bottom or 97 rows from top to bottom. It's taken the 97, it's broken it down into chunks of 10 and the blank ones at the end are, or the extra ones at the end are shown as, uh, as blanks rather than 98, 99 and 100. If I swap that for wrap rows, it does a very similar thing, but it's going across this time instead of down. Okay, so I'm just having a look at uh, the questions. So uh, you never knew about hiding the numbers. Yeah, it's really cool. I use that all the time, Richard, hiding the numbers, the semicolon trick. All right, do we have any other questions? We've had lots of questions and comments throughout, but do we have any other questions? Before well, we I now know back. way more about Simon's love life than anybody needs to. That is very true. Indeed. Yes. All the, all these 55 Valentine's cards he'll have to send. <laughs> Do you realise how much that would cost you these days? Yeah. I, I was shocked. Yeah. Okay, hang on. I need I need to find where we're going. 
I've now got that many windows open. I have no idea where I'm going. Oh, I'm going back to my iMac. Right. Let's say bye-bye. Oh, and I noticed you got called Magic Mike. Did mm -hmm. I? Just saying. Oh, yes, Magic Mike. He's known as Magic Mike at work. It's quite concerning. Right, so freebies. I did mention this in Slack earlier in the week, but just in case you missed it or you're not in Slack, there is a new book about Steve Jobs being released for free. You can get it either as a download, a EPUB download, or you can get it as an Apple book and have it in your Apple Apple books. I uh, haven't managed to read it yet, but it's getting rave reviews. I think it only came out on Tuesday or Wednesday. Uh, but definitely worth a look at. One to get while it's free. I don't know if they're going to intend to charge for it. It comes from somewhere, the Steve Jobs archive, which was something I'd not heard of. So that was interesting as well. So the link's there for you to paste in, Mike. OK. And then we're off, off to the races with it. Right. So moving on to Obsidian. Um, I use an outline. I have a plugin that, that makes the outline feature work a little bit closer to how Rome Research worked. But that's great while I'm working with it. But navigating it was proving a bit trickier until I spotted this plugin, which is the Quiet Outline plugin, which is a community plugin. So I thought we would head off and have a look at that first. Um, that isn't going to take us that long. So I've then got a second bit um, that we will be looking at that is the start of us looking at how to work mobile. Um, not the whole thing, but you need to know certain things before we get going. So that's what we'll be doing. So first off, this quiet outline. Slides not moving again. There we go. Right. So I haven't installed it or anything. So what I'm going to show you is how you navigate at the moment. So this is just a sample page with quick brown foxes jumping over lazy doggies. Um, we've also got this and this has got some stuff in it. So that might work well as well. That is the update that was released, uh, the 1.2 update from a couple of weeks back. Uh, although there is a little tiny update here, isn't there? Which was today. Hmm. Mm. Oh, I'm seeing something that, that I'm, I'm glad I saw that before I mentioned it made myself look an idiot. Right. What I'm talking about is you've got a long document and it's got headings in it. Now, these are proper markdown headings. So um, if I go into there, you can see there is one hash at the beginning of that one and there's two hashes and so forth. So this is actually the CSS page we were using last week. I've just stuck more text in it. So to navigate this, obviously, I can just scroll up and down. I can also put links in and things like that. But there is a dedicated panel that we have for navigating this. In fact, there's a couple of panels when it comes to navigation. Uh, the first one I'll show you is the tags. These are the tags that we've created. So you can see the mic tag, the YouTube tag. Um, so clicking on these will open up the search and it will search for the tag. But what I'm talking about is searching, not actually searching, but navigating within an individual page. And for that, we have this outline panel. If you are not showing that, then you need to go to the preferences and turn it on. But there it is. And what that's showing is that I have a heading one, a two, a three, a four, a five and a six. And if I want to navigate between them, so obviously with them saying heading one, two, three, etc., not gripping in terms of knowing what I'm looking for. But if this one was about um, dog breeding and that was part of the heading, then that would appear in here. So obviously for my demonstration purposes, but I can navigate straight to that content just by clicking it. When you do that, you'll see the destination is highlighted in yellow. And that happens even if it's in another file. It's just to show you that's where you navigated to. This is it. And it puts it in the middle of the page, which is good as far as it goes. You know, and I can navigate the rest of the way as well. But it's missing certain features. Let's just say that. So. I may also have in here like bullet points at, at certain points. So let's put a couple of bullet points in as well as the dog breeding thing. 
Right. Um, oh, whelping boxes. You're going, to, you're going to have doggies. You're going to need whelping boxes and blankets. Right. So I've put a couple of things in, in like bullet points as an outline. Right. Next step, go and find this community plugin. So over to the preferences, into the community plugins. Every time I come in here, I check for updates, which I have already done and I have updated one. So I always do that and then go on to browse. And I'm looking for something called the quiet outline. So it's saying make outlines quiet and more powerful, including no auto expand, rendering headings as markdown and search support. All right. So that's the one we'll install. So I'm clicking on this and I'm clicking on install. Now, there is some information in here. Um, majority of the text is in English, but the demonstrations don't seem to be. I ended up watching a video in Chinese the other day. It was amazing how many words were actually English words. Right, so uh, I'm going to install that. At that stage, it's installed, but it's not updated. So um, it's not enabled rather. So I need to enable it. Once I've got it enabled, I get a different set of buttons. And the one I'm interested in is the options for this. So initially it has a primary color set that is toggled on with this. And I can set a rainbow line color, although I've never actually seen that appear too much. Uh, let's choose that and, and choose the orange one. Right. Then you've got, do you want to render the markdown, um, including strings as markdown format? So that's on by default. The ellipsis is there when, um, if you've got long headers and you don't want them to wrap, then you can turn that on and it will show the dot, dot, dot at the end rather than the full thing. Then do you want a search area at the top? Well, I'm going to leave these set to on because otherwise you're, you're reducing the functionality of the plugin. So I'll leave that turned on. Same with the level switch. Now, the default level is the level you would like this expanded to when you go to a page. So initially it's set to no expansion, but you can change it all the way to a H5, which we'll go back and do. Then you've got hide the unsearch, so hide irrelevant headings when you're searching, which is turned on. The regex is off, but if you are fluent in regex, you may want to turn that on. We're planning a regex, aren't we? This mm. keeps getting pushed out a bit. Introduction to regex. Then you've got the auto expand. Do you want it to auto expand and collapse when you're scrolling, which is set to on? The last one is set to off and it's got a little exclamation mark because what it's saying is if you drag the headings in this new panel that you're going to get, um, it's going to move content, which you might think is a grand idea and then realise it's not such a good idea at all. So it's turned off. So you actually have to turn that on if you want to be able to reorganise your content using this new outline mode. So I'm, I've not actually changed anything there apart from turn on a rainbow line colour and, and hope that something happens. Right, so I'm going to close that. Now, initially, it doesn't look like anything has happened at all. It is installed. It is available. You could set a shortcut for it. But you also have your command and P. And you can put in there quiet and it will show you all of the options that you've got. So let's turn that on and it opens up this panel at the top. I would much prefer to have that somewhere else. I would actually replace this panel with it. This is the built in outliner. This one is going to give you more functionality. But what we'll do is we'll put it over there and that way we can do a comparison between them. So let's pop it over there. So this is the built in one and this is the custom one. At the moment, you're not seeing anything in that because we haven't got it on a page. But if I click in here, you can see we are off to the races. So we now have a heading one. The reason we're only seeing a heading one is we, we had that option, if you remember, and it said, what's your default expansion? And it was set to heading one. If you want to see all the way to heading five, you could change that in the preferences. But at this stage, it's looking fairly similar to the built in option on, on the right. Uh, this option here takes you to the bottom. So it's going down to the bottom of the document and you can see what's happening as I do that. As I move down the document, these are the rainbow things. So you can follow through the levels and it's going all the way down to our heading six, which is uh, down here. There's our heading six. As I scroll up, you can see it's highlighting, 
But as I go up to the next level up, it automatically folds it up, which was also an option. Notice while I'm doing that, so let's go all the way back down to the bottom, nothing is happening over here because it doesn't do that. You would need to navigate in here. You can navigate and you can click on it. This is just giving you much more functionality and options with it. Right, other things you can do. If I go up to here, you're seeing no expansion, which is correct. It's doing it automatically. But as I move across, you can automatically have these headings expanded like that. So if under our heading three dog breeding, we had in there another heading. So we'll make that a heading four. more about dog breeding. Right. You can see that you do get to see that in here as well. Um, in here, if that was folded up, so as, as we were, let's fold up to our heading one at the top. We're at the heading one. This is showing heading one and it's also showing the next level. This is not showing anything. But if in here uh, we take that over there, you can see more about dog breeding and navigate straight to it. This nothing giving you nothing. The other thing that you can do, which is incredibly useful, and the longer the page, the more useful it is, is that you can go in here and you can actually search. So if we're searching for dog breeding, you can see it opens it up and we've got dog breeding and more about dog breeding. So the two results are being shown here and then you click on them and it will take you there. And just like the built in outliner over here, it highlights in yellow so you know exactly where you are. And if we open that, you can click on the more about dog breeding and there you go. Uh, this one here resets it all. So once you've got, you know, you've set, I set that over to five and I had something in the input, it's completely reset it. All I'd need to do is to take that across if I wanted to open all of that up. I think that's fantastic. I'm going to be changing this one that I did have open. I must admit, I don't use it that often because most of my notes are atomic notes. I don't tend to have reams and reams of stuff. If we look at the files that I've got in here, um, these notes ones, when I've got my notes in there, that's probably about as long as I would have. But obviously I'd have replay links and I'd have the stated intention, any announcements that were made, the notes that I've taken, which would be in here. I would have all of those. But I think to navigate with this is probably much easier, even though these are all level two. So the only thing it's opening up in the admin notes is the replay. I haven't added at the moment the structure to that, but I do when I'm taking notes. So once I've taken the notes, I'll have level three, four, five and six headings in there. And I think that is a really great way to be able to navigate something like that. So I will be replacing it. I will take that from there and I will put it down to here and I'll probably choose to hide that one. Um, I might leave it there at the background just in case at that point. But what I will show you in here is let's go back to the other one, which is this long one here. Carol says she's installed and enabled it, but doesn't see the icon. Uh, what icon? Which icon where? I don't I, know. I ran that from Command and P and typed quiet and turned it on from there. So I did Command and P, quiet, and that quiet outline, the top option, um, will show you that panel. Um, I'm assuming you could put that. Let's go and have a look if we go into the preferences and we go in here. I, you know, I never know how to do this because uh, I never do it. Right. Let's have a look. Is it under appearance? Uh, zoom level snippets. No. What are you doing to me? Uh, or is it a core plugin now? Never do it. Command palette. Uh, no, that's not the one, is it? It's not command palette. It's the thing on the side. Um, she says perfect, so I presume she's sorted it. Yeah, I was thinking you can probably put this, if I can find it, which I never use. It, so I don't know where it is. Oh, gosh, there's so many things in here. It, it's a nightmare to try and find anything. Um, it, that you can edit what's shown over here. I've just totally forgotten where it actually is at the moment right now. She's got it now. Um, pin, no, it's somewhere in there, but I have no idea. 
I have no idea. So we'll go back to that. Um, but you could have it where you toggle it on and off from here if you wanted to. I just find command and P and then that's all I've got to remember. Don't have to remember anything else. Just remember command and P and then start typing it. But once it's there, I did have a problem many months ago that I had like a view set up on the desktop and it didn't ripple through to mobile, but it does now. So I've never had a problem having to reset something. One thing I might be able to, I might contemplate doing is having setting up a workspace which has that showing. And then if you don't want it in a certain other workspace, then do that. Um, but the options that I was going to look at. So quiet outline in here. Um, the one I thought was the most important to me was this expansion. It might make sense to, to expand to a heading one, but most of the time I'm going to want to see it all. So I can set that to a level five, which means if I go to one file, it expands the lot. And technically, if I go to another, it should and it's not. And I don't know why. So uh, probably it remembered where it was. That could be to do with another plugin that I've got that remembers my position. But if I do that, then that actually works. Um, now, this green thing at the top was bothering me. I know it's ridiculous, but I thought the green thing was bothering me. But you can in here. Uh, now, is it that one? Mm. I can't remember which one I changed now, but I changed one. And what I did was I picked up the standard purple from there. Yes, it makes it purple. So to me, I can understand people might want that to really stand out. I wanted it to mute itself so it looked like the rest of the interface. So I just picked up the color, but you can do that with it. So for navigating longer documents, and like I say, I don't have that many long documents, but I think that's got a lot more functionality than the one that's built in. And that looks great. So I, I love that. So I think that's, um, I don't install that many plugins. Um, I might read about them and think, oh, that's amazing. And then think, would you use that? And the answer is probably no. So but this one, I think that does give you some functionality that's that's nice. And where I do have long content, I think that would be a much easier way to navigate it than doing the old scroll up and scroll down stuff. So quiet outliner one to look at. Um, Question from Jammy. OK. Who's not well. Oh, poor Jammy. Uh, I think you've covered this ages ago, but how do you get that sliding side view for your notes? Can't remember for the life of me how to change it. Originally, this wasn't built in at all. It was um, a plugin called Andy's plugin, um, Andy Matushek. Um, now it's built in, but it's not the default. So if I were to go to my calendar and I were to open a page, you would see it would open in a tab at the top and not down here at the side. I have a shortcut key set up to toggle between the two. My shortcut key is control and the section key, which is above the tab key. But you can do that. Um, is it side? Toggle the side bar, side, side, side. I have no idea what the command is. Let's go and find out. Let's see if we can find it. So in the hot keys, oh, I've got a command with a conflict. This is new to 1.3, isn't it? Um, the very latest update will enable you to, to find conflicting extension shortcuts. So I've got one showing there before we go any further. Um, but what is this called? Is it tab view? Close the tabs, focus on the tabs, go to the tabs. Tab wasn't a good thing to uh, there. I've got this conflicting with something new tab, right? Uh, toggle tack um, toggle stacked tabs. So my shortcut there is control and that is a back tick. Now, it, it's not actually a back tick on my keyboard. It's not. It's the section key, but I think that's where the back tick is on American keyboards, is it? It's definitely not that, but but that's the key. So all you need to do is toggle it. So if you don't want to remember a shortcut key, if you bring up Command and P and you toggle stacked tabs, which is that one there, it will flip it around to the side. So for me, I, I always want it in the sliding view, always. Uh, and you now, so let me open up a few more of these. Right. So if I put all of these 
in here. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll put them all together. That's what we'll do. Put them over there. So I'm putting these in so they're all in the same space. There's actually two spaces there at the moment. So one is this left hand side and one is the right. But if I take these and they're all then together in there, I can navigate by number. So the first tab is command and one and that is command and two. And then if I go to five and six and then back to two and it whizzes between them. So I love the side view. So it's as simple as that. I have it on a shortcut key. Other than that, you're going to use command and P and type toggle and then toggle them. Right. OK, that's it for questions. Yeah. The gym. No good will ever come of it, Jammy. Stay home. Eat Jammy Dodgers. Works for me. Right. OK, let's whip back into there. And this time this we're now setting up um, how to work on multiple devices. So far, we've been working on single one single device and it wouldn't have mattered where your data was. You could have had that data in iCloud. You could have had it locally, had it on a NAS. P cloud uh, doesn't matter, literally doesn't matter. It's when you come to work with multiple devices that the trouble starts. So sync options that you have in Obsidian. It's not like Evernote where you're logged into your account. You don't even need an account to use it. You're not logged into an account and then you log into the same account on another device and it synchronizes. That's not it at all. That doesn't mean that it's more difficult. It's actually way easier, I think. So your entire vault is one folder locally. And that's what we've been working with with this demo vault. It's one local folder. But what options do we have when we come to sync? So people tend to get confused. They start talking about 27 different services before you even think of anything else. Now, it could be uh, like, say, my circumstance. So say I've got it on my desktop and I want to put it on my laptop because I need to work in bed for the day or an iPad. But we'll say a laptop for a reason. Right. I need to be able to sync it. Or do I? I just need access to the folder. There's no syncing involved particularly, particularly not from the Obsidian end. It just needs access to where this folder is. So on my laptop, I could just point to the folder on my iMac. Or if I put that folder in Dropbox, I could point to it there. And I, there's no other settings other than to say, open that folder. That's it. But there is a number one question before you get any further. Do you need to sync to Apple mobile devices? That's the primary question. If the answer to that is no, awesome, you're minted. Any service will do as long as the device you have in your hand, a laptop, a Windows machine, a Linux box, as long as the device can see the folder, that's it. So you could use Dropbox, iCloud, OneDrive, Google Drive, doesn't matter. As long as it can see that folder, any service will do. The complication comes in if the answer to that question is yes, because then you are much, much more limited. It's not Obsidian's fault. Don't think that they have deliberately decided not to support Dropbox or OneDrive or Google Drive. It is not their fault. They have actually come out and said, if anyone can help us to make this work, get in touch. The reason that it's more difficult is because it's Apple and it's a mobile device. It's a toy. It's an iPad or it's a phone. And they are fantastic. I know that. And once you've got Obsidian installed and it's synchronizing, you can barely tell the difference between that and the desktop. But the sync to set it up you need to think it through. So if you do need to synchronize with Apple mobile devices, you have two options, possibly three. I have heard people have had success with GitHub. I have never tried it, so I'm not prepared to say, yeah, it works. I have tried iCloud and I have tried Obsidian Sync. I use Obsidian Sync. The rationale for that, I appreciate, not cheap. I think it was 
26 Canadian dollars, which ended up being about 60 pounds, I think, for the year. Now, you can synchronize multiple volts. So it's not a sync service that's like, I've got 300 volts, can I sync the lot? No, it synchronizes five volts, but they don't have to be your volts. So what made Obsidian Sync a no brainer for me was I knew I needed it to sync. I was using iCloud at the time. Spoiler, it didn't end well. I also knew that Mike was using Dropbox, so he couldn't sync it with his mobile devices. So I decided if I got Obsidian Sync, I could sync my primary vault and Mike's primary vault and we would still have three slots left. So that's why I went for Obsidian Sync. I had a heck of a day with it where nothing was syncing with iCloud. And I thought life's too short, can't be doing with it. So I got Obsidian Sync. But iCloud had worked fine for two weeks. I don't know what upset it on this particular day. So I'm going to show you the, the free way to do it. The only way that's free for Apple devices that is supported, and that is iCloud. And it's not tricky. Setting up Obsidian Sync, a little bit more tricky. I will show you that if you are interested in that in another show. But in this one, we're going to look at iCloud. When I say it's not tricky to set up, it really isn't tricky to set up. Um, as long as iCloud's in a good mood, <laughs> which obviously caveats that greatly. Right. So I have this demo vault. Um, this demo vault is in the same location as my other vaults locally. So where your vault is locally for Obsidian Sync doesn't matter. Obviously, for iCloud Sync, it does. So to be able to sync this vault, this vault would need to live in the correct place. And where it is, is not the correct place. So I will close that. Obsidian's still open, but I've closed that vault. What I now need to do is go and find it. So let's bring this in, which is the finder, and find it. So mine live in here. I have an application support folder. So these were my demos from today and those were my two um, images. So they would just go in my inbox. That's what that looks like all the time. My application support folder has application has folders in it for various other things. So this is backing up Zoom chats, I think. This is my ITV archive. This is Cloud Mounter, and that is Obsidian. And you can see when I back up my Obsidian, which admittedly was the beginning of March, 11 meg. No graphics, remember. So in Obsidian in here, you can see I've got my demo vault. I have Mission Control and I have another demo vault called Para. So this is my real vault. This is our demo vault. It's just a folder. Everything that we see in the left hand sidebar, you can see in here as markdown files. It's just a folder. So there's no incantations when it comes to synchronizing it. It just needs to be in the right place. So if I open up another tab, uh, that's that one at the moment, but we need to be in iCloud Drive. So in here, I have all of the files and folders that other apps put in there. I have an Obsidian folder. Now, if you are doing this, you will not have an Obsidian folder. So what makes it trickier is you need to set up the mobile end first. Now, I'm not setting the mobile end up today and it wouldn't make a jot of difference if I was because the folder already exists. But it isn't a case that you can come in here and create a folder called Obsidian because this is iCloud. It does its own thing. It has its own little controller and you can't do that. You would need to do it from the mobile end. But once you have that folder, it behaves just as any other folder. So I've got Flight School, which is um, like a tutorial thing that I got ages ago. And I took my Rome Research graph and I exported it. And that is now in Obsidian format. But you can see my demo one is not there. My demo one is in here. So first thing I would do is make a compressed version of it. It will take seconds because it's just not that big. OK, 
There's the volt, right? Four meg, four meg for a backup. Right, so this volt here, you could leave it where it is and you could copy it, but it'll probably get confusing and you also have that zipped version of it. So I would actually move it. I would move it from here into the Obsidian folder there, which hopefully that's going to move it. Did you move it? You did. Right. So it's now in the right place. Right. If I were to try and open this. So this is like the eagle question earlier. Right. How do I open that inside Obsidian? Because in Obsidian, which again, I've still got running. So if I go to file and open vault, I'll bring that on there. So there's the demo vault and look where it's looking for it. It is looking for it in documents local and that's not where it lives anymore. So I'd need to go to open folder as vault rather than looking at this one. I'll leave that there, but if I wanted to delete that, I can go in here and remove it from the list. So just like this one down here, if I wanted to remove it from the list, you literally just do that. Right. Uh, in fact, that's probably a good idea at this stage, isn't it? Because they're going to be called the same thing. So we'll get rid of them. But I want to open a folder as a vault. Now, at this stage, we're not we're not uh, using multiple devices even yet. We're getting back to where we were because we've had to move the vault. So I'm going to go, go into open. And after it's had a rare old think about it, right, it is going to look in my Obsidian folder, but it needs to look in iCloud Drive. Do we have a question? Yeah, Carol says, how do I get to iCloud on the iPad? Is it iCloud Drive? You don't need to get to iCloud to, to create that folder or do anything. You need to do it through the mobile app. So you would need to go to Obsidian and you would need to say that you're syncing via iCloud. And at that point, it will create that folder. That's why it's got to be done on mobile. It doesn't work on the desktop. But you don't need to go to, through the files app or anything else. Just stick to the Obsidian app. So in here, I had Obsidian. Where have we gone? OP. There's Obsidian. And it should have in it. Go on. You know you want to open. Right. It's got in it my Roam thing, my Flight School thing and my Demo Vault. Right. So I'm going to click open on that. Bearing in mind, we're just getting back to where we were before. This is how you would move a vault locally. If you move that from one folder to another, this is what you would do with it. So I'm going to open that. And there is my vault. Nothing will be different at all. Now, because it's not been opened before, it says, do you trust it? Now, obviously, I created it. So, yes. Um, your options here are to trust it and enable all the external plugins, the community plugins, or you can browse the vault in restricted mode without those in case somebody has sent this to you. All right. And that's why you're getting messages saying the plugin's no longer active. But I do trust the author because, you know, hey ho, that was me. And we are now good to go. There's our link that we had. So there's our CSS page. We can see all of this. Everything's working fine. That is it. There are, there are no magical incantations. Like I said, that's it. Now, how do you get that to sync on other devices? Well, as luck would have it, I have another device. It's not the device I would like it to be. That was why I was moving the chair and it was creaking during your demo, Mike. Sorry about that. Uh, I wanted to show it on my laptop, it, not having it, not having it at all. So uh, that's my laptop, not Obsidian. Oh, where have you gone? So this is my other desktop. This is called Serenity. It's behind me. Uh, so what I have done on, on here, this is why I want to choose a laptop because I've got Obsidian installed. I haven't even got Obsidian installed on this machine. But I thought that would be a good demo then, won't it? So need to install Obsidian for the first time. So let's take that and put that in the applications. So there are no um, vaults on here, nor has this ever been used. So hopefully that's going to be enough and I can eject it. Excellent. And let's see if it will run Obsidian for me. And if it does, is it going to put it on the other screen? Right. No, it's saying you downloaded this from the Internet. Sure, you trust it. Yes. Open it. And this is what it looks like to start with. 
And so it gives you a quick start option, which I don't recall ever going through. Um, if your vault is in Obsidian Sync like mine, then I would need to sign in to Obsidian Sync. But it's not, nor do I want to create a new vault. I want to access the same vault. So that is just opening up a folder as a vault, which we've already done once. So hit open on there. Know that my vault should be in the Obsidian folder in iCloud, if all things are working well. Come on, you know you want to open. Oh, this is another machine that's slow. I do have two monitors on it, though. And one of which is turned off, so that isn't helping me in the slightest. It could have opened it on another window. No, you didn't open it on another window, did you? Right, so why aren't you working when I hit open? Oh, do you not love live demos, Mike? Oh, it's thinking. Well, it's spinning. Crying out loud. You're doing one thing, you're just opening a file. Mm hmm. I will try and see if it's on the other window again. Let's get rid of this. That's where I downloaded Obsidian from. That's the Obsidian that I installed. You can see it's a much bigger, much higher res, this. Uh, but you're not opening over there, are you, when I click open? And I don't know why not. Right, let's quit Obsidian and try again. And if you're wondering how I'm doing that, because it looks like magic, doesn't it? Alfred's coming up on the other screen. <laughs> the one we're not looking at. Right. Oh, excellent. Right. Now, because I haven't used anything else, it's gone to the Obsidian folder in iCloud. And there is my demo vault at the top. Unhelpfully, it hasn't actually downloaded it yet. But helpfully, it has uploaded it from over here. So I'm going to click on the little icon, try and download it. Um, iCloud spins into action. <clears throat> we could be a while. What time's breakfast, Mike? Oh, there you go. That, that was quite impressive. Mind you, it's only four meg. <laughs> right. So I point it to the folder that contains. Well, that is the vault. There's only one copy of it. It's in iCloud. And I open it from there. And with a bit of luck. So you see, you get exactly the same. Do you trust the author? Yes, it's the same file. It's indexing. So we've got 1,315 files in there and it indexes the lot. It literally takes seconds. It's not even going to take a minute. Uh, and that means it can search much faster once it gets going with it. So there's our CSS and we are good to go. So if I say this is a paragraph that was added on Serenity at, and let's put the time, Right, four minutes past midnight. Right, now, it's still indexing. It's, it's, oh, it's going down, not up, excellent. It'll get there, it'll get there. Right, back on this machine, what I would want to see is that I open my vault from there. And do I already have it open? I do. Right, there it is. Right, so same vault, and you can see that is already there. So when it's working, the synchronization via iCloud, is instant. When it's not, it's infuriating. Absolutely infuriating. Um, I, I gave up rather than try and work out what was wrong with it. But if you have a good experience with iCloud, which I'll admit I don't, Ulysses uses iCloud, Drafts uses iCloud. And I do find that I'll make something on another device and I'll come back to this device and I won't have the content and I need to close the app and reopen it. But that was instant. That was good, wasn't it? Should we quit while we're ahead? <laughs> <laughs> but what the point I'm making is this machine behind us here and this instance that you're looking at, they're, are they synchronizing? They're both accessing the same files. It's iCloud that's making sure that all of the changes that you make on any device are added there. And you can, with that, add in the mobile situation. So that is what we will look at next week, unless you want to look at anything different. So do we have any questions on the sync of it? No. That Carol was... says she's on the iPad. I thought you'd answered that question. Um, how do you get iCloud on the iPad? 
Well, as I've said, if you're going to work with mobile and you've not done it before, so if you've never had any vault in iCloud in Obsidian, then you would need to do this through Obsidian. Um, is that what you mean when you say you're on iPad? If you're iPad only, you could have your vault local to the iPad. The problem with that is it wouldn't then get backed up in any kind of way. So I would probably steer away from that. I don't know what happened with mine, but I got to a point where it's like I can't waste four hours trying to make something synchronise. That's four hours of content creation that I can't do. So that was why I went for the um, Obsidian Sync and I've touch wood, touch wood, not had one single second of problem with it. I can literally, well, you you had it today, didn't you? Mike was reading my essay today. He found two mistakes in it, but he would, he's eagle eyed. Um, and when I give him my iPad, you swipe down, don't you? Yeah. And you shouldn't swipe down because it takes you to the daily page. So I locked it so he couldn't. So he looked at it gingerly um, and I said, it's all right, it's locked. So when he found these mistakes, I corrected them on my desktop and they instantly appeared on the iPad that was in his hand. And that does seem to be working with iCloud at the moment. She sorted it. Yeah, Excellent. sorted it. Right. OK, if that is it for questions on that, we will wrap up. So what do we have coming up? We have we have non-working slides again. Right. We have coming up same time, same place next week. We are getting towards that 200, 191 Friday, the 21st, nine o'clock UK time, which is um, three o'clock Eastern and 12 o'clock West, West Coast. Right. On demand, we have everything, including the shorts, of which there'll be more this week. I've got to ramp up production on that. I've got to get more than two out in seven days. <laughs> I'm learning. What can I say? It'll get faster. I've no idea how long it'll take me to get 30 shorts out. We'll find out. But you will find everything at youtube.com slash Elaine Giles. There is a playlist dedicated to after hours. You will find that at mattbytes.co.uk slash after hours playlist. And of course, we love you. You have shown us a lot of love in terms of subscriptions. I think over 3,000 in the last three weeks, which is amazing. Um, so thank you very much for that. Put a like on this video. That would help us immensely. And of course, subscribe. Keep the subscribers going up. And that way, I, 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 how long is it going to take me to get out of the mode of thinking I'll wake up and I'll be back to like 15,000? <laughs> could take a while but hit the subscription uh, button and the notification bell and you will miss nothing uh, there's also my list at elainegiles.com slash vip where you get first notification of upcoming sessions and i've got two in the works at the moment just got to decide between them might actually put details of both of them in the next email and let you vote that might be a good idea everything macbytes you will find at macbytes.co.uk slash macbytes dash mail and then, of course, there's the Slack chat room where we carry on the conversation. If you need to join, it's totally free. You need to go to macbytes.co.uk slash join Slack. If you are already a member, you just need to go to macbytes.co.uk slash Slack and you will be able to join us and it would be a pleasure to see you in there. So what other chat things have we got? Um, did you say three o'clock start no i said three o'clock east coast oh gosh it's not is it no, it's, it's four, four. it's four yeah. ignore me ignore me i don't know the time <laughs> <laughs> no i'm not changing the time i'm not i've just updated it in the chat excellent thank you very much <laughs> oh dear i thought you'd change the no, start no. start time behind my bag <laughs> Oh, come on, it's late. It is. It's, it's late. It's bedtime. Oh, good grief. So, do we have any questions on that? No. Or anything that you'd like to see? So, Jammy, was it the gym that did it to you? I keep telling you, stay away. Duvet days. Yes, you did, Jammy. You missed me doing a demo. Go back and watch the recording. Oh, yes. We actually introduced him as Toblerone Thomas as well, didn't we? And... Yep. Zimbop, that's Simon, was sharing his love life with us. Oh, you missed so much. Can't be done. You've got to be here on time. <laughs> Kim was worried. Sorry about that. Ignore me. Ignore me. It's, it's not It's not noon either, is it? It's one. It's one, I yeah. was out by an hour. Why was I out by an hour? No idea. Ignore me. 
Yeah, it's Friday. That's I am actually, well, well, I didn't have the best of days, did I? No. No. So I didn't actually get started working. Um, you know what I said? Carol will laugh at this. I said to Mike, because you were talking about dinner, weren't you? When dinner was convenient and stuff. And I said, well, look, you take the dog, because she wouldn't go out because it was raining, because she's such a princess. <laughs> it's raining, so she won't go out. She needs one of Sherpa's coats. That, that yellow coat that he wears. You'd never get it on her. Samoids don't like clothes. Do you remember when we tried putting, putting anything on Maya? Didn't like it. Um, but she wouldn't go out. So it's like, well, we'll have to wait until the rain stops. Because you played with her mind. Last Saturday, he said, I'll take her out, take her out. And I said, you better get out before it rains. Look at that cloud. It'll be fine, he said. Two seconds later, once he'd got the leads on, hailstones the size of golf balls. She looked at him as though, ha, you're on your own, boy. <laughs> So we ended up we're like looking at the, 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 the calendar, trying to work out when we could eat. I said, it's fine. We'll eat while Captain's table's on and I'll make notes later. You know, I, I'll just I'll just browse it. Oh, Captain's table was amazing. I was putting the fork in the wrong place. I was missing my mouth by about six inches. It was so good. So we need not to do that again, don't we? I need to make notes at the time. And then you need to watch it again at like half speed to make sure that you extract all of the goodness out of it. I'm hoping that, that I've got the replay link in my email as I sit here, but I don't know. Carol, have, have we had the replay email? Because I definitely need that. Oh, I think we have. I think we have. Uh, or was that yesterday's? Um, no, I think it's it. I think I've got it. It, it was mind blowing. In fact, Carol, I was sat watching it. And obviously, you guys know that I, I went. Um, when was the first time I did Second Brain? Oh, ages ago. I, got, I bought into Second Brain in 2019. And the first one I attended live was 2020. And um, they insist on every session in doing breakout rooms. And I can't be doing with it. Sometimes I'm in the mood for a breakout room and sometimes I'm not. Most of the time, not. The other thing is, if you don't do video and I don't do video on Zoom, you get ignored. You get totally ignored. So last week I thought, OK, I'll be good and I'll do the breakout room. Got totally ignored. And I just sit there thinking to myself as they're talking about stuff. And then, you know, you say hello and you get ignored. It's just like if they can't see you moving, I need chicken. I need chicken there. That's right. Um, if they can't see you moving, you don't exist, even though you're speaking. So they're sitting there struggling with X and struggling with Y and struggling with Z. And I thought, yeah, whatever, because if I say anything, you're not going to listen because <laughs> I'd already said hello twice and got ignored. So they didn't get the benefit of my ex experience. But I was thinking today in um, Captain's Table. And when I went to Captain's Table, it was an obscenely, ridiculously small amount of money for Captain's Table. And the thing was, your grandfather done it. So you only had to pay that every year. It is now eight to nine times more than I paid. And, you know, even that they're undercharging. It's that good. So I was sat there, Carol. You, you, you were in there. Carol was the star of the show. And I'm there thinking, do you know, these guys don't need to waste time with a breakout room. They would just value, value, value the whole of the time. So, yeah, it's um, it's ruining me for everything else, isn't it, Mike? Mm. Yeah. And I just sit there going, oh, that's good. Oh, look, they've picked Carol. <laughs> it was a great, great session today. It was amazing. Uh, right. What's going on here in the chat? Um, Carol's got the, got the mail. Yeah, I think I've got the mail now. I think it was the last mail that came in. So I've got the mail now. Excellent. Um, an unboxing next week would go a long way to aiding your recovery. Would it really? Mm. We'll find something to unbox. We'll Send me something. a Toblerone, I'll unbox it. <laughs> ah, Jamie says, here's a quick question. Any insider knowledge about when the Affinity updates are landing? Uh, when you least expect it, probably, like everything else. No, I don't. No, I don't. They'll be ready when they're ready. I mean, I got a mail from one company saying, um, you can start talking about this now. Um, it's been in beta for like two years, but the latest version of their app is out. You can start talking about it now. We're going to release it by the end of April. So I clicked OK on that email and I went to the next one. It said, we've we've released it. I thought that was well, that was quick. <laughs> you know, you're telling me I've got two weeks to talk about it and all of a sudden it's released. <laughs> Crazy stuff. So I, I don't know. I really don't know. 
I must be rich taking those classes. Well, the thing is, Deb, no, because I, I just wouldn't go for them. Um, there's another one that I was interested in and the price just skyrocketed. And I mean, it used to be like £500, which is not a small sum. It's now £9,000. It's the same thing. I'm not doing it. But what happened with Build a Second Brain was I'd looked at it and I think it was about one and a half, two thousand. And I thought, I'm not risking that because I, I don't know if, you know, not knowing, hearing from anybody who had done it, whether it was any good or not, you don't know. So I thought, no, I'm not doing that. Anyway, he was he got married and he was moving back to the States. So he couldn't do a live cohort in the autumn of 2019. But obviously, if you're moving house, money would be good, wouldn't it? So he made available an, an on demand version of this thing. So you did join Second Brain, just like if there was a live cohort, but there was no live cohort. But at that stage, you were grandfathered to every future cohort. And the thing was, he reduced the price to about £500. Then I found a coupon which reduced it even more. And I thought, I'll do that because I knew I would have this um, self-paced version and then I would go into the cohort in the uh, spring of 2020. I didn't realise the spring of 2020 was going to bring with it COVID. So, yeah, I had lots of time to do it. Um, but that's what I did. So that probably cost about £400, something like that. But every cohort I've done since has been free. So I don't keep paying for it. Um, Ship 30 was on my radar after a particular cohort of Second Brain. And the thing was, when you get to the end of a cohort based course, it's like the earth just falls away from you. It's like, well, what am I going to do with myself now? You know, I was working 48 hours a week on this course and now I've got nothing to do. So you want to keep in touch. You want to keep the momentum going. And so many people were writing, I'm joining Ship 30. I'm joining Ship 30. And I thought, what's Ship 30? So I went in and I found it and I had a look and I thought, well, if it's just writing for 30 days, Carol's going to fall off her chair now, knowing what Carol knows. But I'm thinking to myself, oh, you know, if it's just writing for 30 days, I don't need the accountability. I'm quite capable. I'm a grown up. I can write for 30 days without paying for the privilege. Uh, but what happened was I think it was £350 at the time and I got this voucher for £100 off. So I thought, hmm, no, that's 250 And this was dollars. So by the time I'd converted it, but then I found another coupon for another 50 off. And I thought, well, you wouldn't use the 50 if you got 100 Who knew? They were cumulative. So I think I paid in the end about £180. So I did the cohort, loved it. The content was fantastic. And then at the end of it, it's like, do you want to join the captain's table? And I, the content had been so good that I thought, yeah, I'll do that for a year. You know, for a year. And the, my rationale was not for the captain's table content. My rationale was there'll be another four cohorts and it saves paying for each one individually. Because if you're on the captain's table, you don't pay for the cohorts. So I paid for the captain's table. Oh, wow. The stuff on the captain's table was just blew you away. Um, so that now the captain's table, I do um, pay for every year. But I pay the rate of when I took it, which is about £350 for the year. It is a bargain. It's like, take my money. And then at Christmas, they run a competition. So there's different levels of, of the captain's table. I think one is called jet ski. Um, is the next one speedboat and then yacht. And they're different levels. And the yacht one is expensive. That's about seven grand. So I was bumped up when they did this. I was bumped to the speedboat level, which gave me access to a certain percentage of it. And at Christmas, they ran this competition and it was basically like, you know, jump through a couple of hoops, which was no more literally than putting your name in a box. It wasn't difficult, put it like that. And they would enter you in a competition to win a prize. So I thought, yeah, have a bit of that, you know. You can always do with a nice competition prize. Uh, and I won. So I'm on the, the yacht level now. And I didn't pay for that either. So I, I will tell people that they are fantastic because I really believe that. Do I think you should sign up for Build a Second Brain? Not at the moment, no. Um, they've changed the course to such a degree. There's a lot of the information that, that used to be included that's not included. 
So instead of expanding the content, which Dickie and Cole do all the time, the content's actually been reduced. So I, I couldn't, in all honesty, recommend that anybody did that. You know, it's free for me. So I can dip in, think, no, no, there's nothing new there and dip out. But if you're paying, I think it was one and a half thousand for one cohort. There's, let's just say there's a lot of free content on, on the website and the channels and stick with that on YouTube. But Dickie and Cole are in another league. They do not need breakout rooms to fill the hour. In fact, it gets to the top of the hour and it's like, but we've only been going 10 minutes, surely. It is amazing. It is amazing. I'm happy to recommend that. Carol's not getting to bed early tonight. Is this because you're still pumped from what went on before? Deb, if you want to look at building a second brain and see how it works and what you need to do, just buy the book. The book has lots of examples in it. Um, I think the thing that's missing from the book is the depth, but it's eight pounds, eight dollars. Get the book. There isn't actually much more happens in the course now. There used to be a lot more in the course and that's the problem. So don't, don't spend one and a half on it. Just buy the book. There's some very good content on the Forte Labs website and there's some stuff on the YouTube channel. But I'll say the YouTube channel content is optimised for YouTube. It's not optimised for people wanting to learn. So, for example, what I mean by that is I know I go long when I'm demonstrating something, but there's no point showing you half of it. On the YouTube channel, they've got a video and it's 64 notes apps. Yeah, in 16 minutes. Mm. Not giving you much detail on any of those, I can assure you. But that's the kind of content that YouTube PKMers want. They just want to sit there and have they pick the right one or whatever. Um, I thought the video was shocking. <laughs> to me, that was valueless because the, it was just like, and there's this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And I'm like, yeah, but, but when would I choose which? The other thing they've done is archetypes, note taking archetypes, which categorize you as like a gardener, a librarian, um, an architect or something else, you know, and I've read all the notes on it. I've sat through the sessions. I've watched the video. I'm like, don't care. I just take notes. I am not going to categorize myself into I am a gardener. I must do it this way. I take notes. And if it's something that I need to share with Mike, I'll put it in Notion. If it's something for Matt Bites, it'll go in Notion. If it's for me, it'll go in Obsidian. If it's handwritten, it'll go in Good Notes. I don't care whether I'm a gardener or an architect or anything else either. But that seems to have become like they've actually added it onto your profile picture. Yeah, please fill in what archetype you are. I've ignored it. I'm not jumping through hoops like that. I don't care. It doesn't matter. So buy the book, work through the book. If you've got any questions, ask me. That would be my best advice. Patience said it was 499 last time you checked. That must have been a while ago. <laughs> it's three times that now. <laughs> oh, that was a good idea, Carol. Yes. Now, one thing you could do if you are if you do have like an employer rather than being self-employed, um, they do provide you with a letter for Build a Second Brain. But even so, you know, I think if I had to choose between the two, there is no competition. There really isn't. Sadly, not the captain's tip. That's unfortunate. But keep going for the competitions because you never know you might win. I know you won once, didn't you? I don't forget what you won. Um, but yeah, that they do actually, they do have real winners on these things. <laughs> I was amazed. It was over Christmas and this mail came in. And you know what you're like, you're trying to get through your inbox as fast as you can. Like, oh, not another one from Ship 30. What's that? And it was like, congratulations. I thought, pardon. <laughs> Whoa, slow down. Um, there was, there was some, first prizes and some second prizes. Mine was a second prize, but I was thrilled. I was absolutely thrilled. That was exactly what I wanted. The only thing I don't have that, that would be kind of useful that I'm not interested in paying for is Typeshare. So when they do these um, live sessions and, and they're pulling, pulling out a winner from anybody who's on the leaderboard, um, if one of them was me and it happened to be Typeshare lifetime, that would be good. <laughs> I'd like that. That would be good. Uh, oh, Carol Speedboat. I think that's a middle one, isn't it? That's what I was. Uh, the concept of Ship 30 would be great for serious use in a classroom. It really would. That, you know, somebody making something for 30 days and it doesn't have to be that difficult. I know when I started, I, I was so I started writing and I think I was writing them too long. And that meant I then had to edit them down. 
But when I did my first one this time, it was just like, I only need three paragraphs. It's fine. And it was like 180 words. But I didn't really know this time what would be going in the Daily Posts. Um, so I started off with, you know, this is why I'm writing. And then I did, OK, I'm breaking all the rules. I'm going to do videos because I'm, I'm not a writing girl. I'm a video girl. So it was my way of getting video involved in it. Um, then I, once I'd done the video, it was like, whoa, what I wished I'd known before I did the video. But that is not planning ahead. That's not like what you're writing on day 13. I've got no clue. So today's, what, what was today's? You read it. Um, about page publishing. numbers. Page numbers, wasn't it? Mm, yeah. yeah. All the things about page numbers, because the next short will be about page numbers. Um, so it's a bit meta. I'm doing half the posts that are complementary to the video with this is what I've talked about in the video. And the other one is like a commentary on how I'm doing with the video creation. They have actually proved to be really popular. Um, people have replied with like, whoa, I'd never thought of that. Wouldn't have thought of this. Yeah, I'm going to make a note of that in case I ever do a short. So doing the commentary on how I'm doing what I'm doing is also useful. So, yeah, I think it's a really good thing for kids. And also they, they like the kind of, you know, put a tick in a box each day. Um, I do it where I have 30 posts ready. I mean, you've seen it, I think, haven't you? Let me see if I've got it handy to just show you. That looks possible. Right, let's do that. And that. And magic here. And show you. So what I do with mine is when I start, I have the whole 30 days planned out. So I know which cohort it is that filters it for my view in here. Uh, put the date in. That is literally just copied and pasted from a spreadsheet. Uh, numbers are copied and pasted. Days are copied and pasted. Um, I'm re was really happy this time that I could just select all of these and change the icon. So there is now the ability to change the icon on all of them. So that was a time saver. And when I've shipped, I changed the icon from an anchor to a ship. So I don't really have a status showing on there of like shipped because I can quickly at a glance, I can tell. So tomorrow, not a clue. Not a clue. <laughs> you said don't plan in hand. I really don't. But it might be um, a commentary on how I've split the content because I left today's with how I was going to manage. So that was it. So there were seven tips for mastering page numbers. I can't get seven tips in one minute. There's no way. So I put the burning question is how I'm going to get all of that in a YouTube short. I'll let you know next time. So I think what I'll end up doing is the first two in one short and the next five in the other one. Uh, no, I can do the first three, I think. Yeah. So the first three in one and four in the other. That's my plan, unless I have to split it even further. But then I will write an essay that will explain why I did it the way I did it. And I can get one of these out in literally five minutes now, thankfully. So this this one, although when you go into type share, it takes the title, which is that bit, and it puts it in as the tweet. They always told us at, ages ago to have like a hook tweet. So that's why there's two of them. This goes in with the essay and then I add it to the thread with this one. Um, that's how it works. But because I've got this page set up, so if you look at like tomorrow, it's just blank with spaces for everything. So the essay will go under here. Any research will be hidden under the toggle. The final essay will go in there. And then these three. So this is the hook one. This is the one that adds it to the thread. And this is if I'm I've put if I'm recommending an app. But if I've got a short, then I will put that as the URL to the short um, well, description of the short and put that in there. So, yeah, it's all sorted out. Just need the actual content now. But there you go. That's what I do with it. I'm assuming Carol's got something similar. Right. Let me get in there because now I can't see the chat. Where's the chat gone? There we go. There's the live chat. OK, so um, have we got any other questions before I head off? No. Nope. Right. Uh, Deb did another writing course, more oriented to family history. Not cheap, but enjoyable. The class you can visit again and again. If you've got something that's, you know, it's not just a writing course, it's in a specific genre, that's probably much better. Um, got the Audible and watch the YouTube channel. 
Yeah, I think maybe the book, if that's about Build a Second Brain, maybe the book might give you something to highlight as well, um, rather than just listen. I've got the Audible version. I've got the book as well. But the content sound, the difference between that and Ship 30, and I think Carol will agree, the guys in Ship 30 are developing their content daily, daily. I think the last, the cohort I'm in at the moment for Second Brain, the stuff is exactly the same as it was three years ago. It's not really been refined for the new note taking apps that we have and the new ways that we think. Um, there is a session. Um, I'm not I think this one is open to everybody, but I'm not sure if it's paid for. I'll find out. But the, he's doing a session on AI on the 21st of April, which Carol's grinning already because I'm thinking to myself, if you're going to do a session on AI, you are going to have to knock it out of the park to beat the Ship 30 guys. So I must admit I'm going into this session very sceptical, but we'll see. I'll let you know. <laughs> right. OK, then I will say if there are no more questions, see Carol's agreeing there. Mm. I would not be wanting to put something on about AI if to, to a group of people who had been in ship 30. Trust, trust me on that. Doing AI is one thing. But, you know, when, when the people in ship 30 who have seen it, not once, not twice, three, four, five, six times up to now, every time is like, whoa, really? It is. It's just amazing. And, you know, you don't get that in many other courses. So um, will I be paying my bill when it comes in in June? Absolutely. <laughs> gleefully. In fact, when I won the prize at Christmas, I made sure that I could stick, you know, this doesn't impact my grandfathered rate, does it, on, on Captain's Table? Because if it does, I'm not, I'm not to take the prize away <laughs> because it's so expensive now, but it is worth every penny. They do do it properly, although I felt today it was fascinating that there were, there were about 40 minutes in, they started they, they went very quiet. So there were some quiet bits and it was as though they were each thinking about it. And then one was saying to the other, we should include this for them. Yeah. And if we did that, then we could give them that because I know they're using these sessions to actually build up the final course. And I thought that was fascinating to see behind the scenes. You actually saw not just the content and, and the raw content. So the final thing will be even better. But you saw the thought processes that went into it. And I love that. I love that. It was very, very good. Right. OK, so I am going to say good night from me and good night from me. And we will both see you next time. Stay safe, guys.